Okay, I like that everyone is nice and quiet. So with that being said, we're getting ready to start. So if we can silence our cell phones as I'm doing. Can I just have a piece of bread? Slack. That's good. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. And if we can keep the back door closed and the side doors closed, I greatly appreciate that as well. OK, good evening, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Wednesday, the 20th day of March in the year 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 6 p.m. start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 6.04 p.m. May we, may we have a roll call for the commencement of this meeting? Councilperson Ridley. Here. Councilperson Prinzeri. Here. Councilperson Baggiano. Here. Councilperson Soleil. Here. Councilperson Solomon. Here. Councilperson Gilmore. Councilperson DeGeese. Here. Councilperson Rivera. Here. And Council President Waterman. Here. We have all nine council members in attendance at 6.04 p.m. Can we kindly rise for a moment of silence, please? India J. Edwards. India J. Edwards. Wayne Taylor, retired Jersey City firefighter. Thank you very much on behalf of Council President Waterman and the members of the Municipal Council in accordance with New Jersey Public Laws of 1975, Chapter 231, the Open Public Meetings Act, also known as the Sunshine Law. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by the posting on a bulletin board of the first floor City Hall, the annual notice, which is the schedule of meetings and caucuses for the Municipal Council for the calendar year 2024 and filed in the office of the City Clerk on Thursday, November 30th, 2023. In addition, at its time of its preparation, the agenda of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, March 15th, 2024 at 647 p.m. to the mayor, municipal council, business administrator, corporation council, and the local newspapers and posted on the city's website. So I can certify as our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. OK, council members, before we move on to uh, the order of the agenda, as per the caucus meeting, we have some I'm sorry if I'm going in and out. We have some late items that we need to add to the agenda officially, starting with item 3.4, City Ordinance 24-017 is an ordinance amending the charter of the City of Jersey City to adopt ranked choice voting as the method to elect the mayor, council, and school board subject to the approval of this ordinance by the voters to amend the city charter by binding referendum to be held upon the enactment of state legislation permitting such charter amendment. Motion. Oh, sorry, the other ones. Also item 3.5, city ordinance 24-018 is an ordinance naming the Miller Branch Library Cultural Arts Center uh, auditorium as the David Dowd Williams Cultural Arts Center in honor of Dow David Williams. Item 3.6, City Ordinance 24-019 is an ordinance amending Chapter 175, Food Handling Establishments, and 240, Chapter 242, Peace and Good Order of the Jersey City Code of the City of Jersey City to establish regulations for the third party delivery companies and food deliv delivery drivers. And then we move on to our resolutions. First addition is item 10.37, resolution 24-205 is a resolution of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City recognizing April 1st through April 5th, 2024 as National Community Development Week. Next, 
is item 10.38, resolution 24-206, is a resolution authorizing the city of Jersey City to accept a gift of a bronze statue from the family and friends of the late Michael Young. And last but not least, item 10.39, Resolution 24-207 is a resolution authorizing a closed session of the Municipal Council on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024 at 5 p.m. to discuss issues related to pending litigation. Council members, I need a motion to add items 3.4, 5, and motion. 6. 10.37, 38, and 39. I'm going to give the motion initially to Councilperson Soleil, and I'm going to give that quick second to Councilperson Rivera. On the motion to add all of those items that I read into the record to the agenda, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bajano. Let's make sure our mics are on. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGees. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Motion carries 9-0 to add the items 3.4 through 3.6 and 10.37 through 10.39 to the agenda. So if you would, council members, I will read the first readings into the record. Starting with item 3.1, City Ordinance 24-014 is an ordinance amending Chapter 87 Amusement Devices, Article 1, Automatic Amusement Devices. Item 3.2, City Ordinance 24-015 is an ordinance to codify the planting of native plants throughout the city of Jersey City. Item 3.3, City Ordinance 24-016 is an ordinance supplementing Chapter 332, Vehicles and Traffic, Article 9, Parking for the Disabled of the Jersey City Code, designated and reserved parking space at various locations throughout the city. Item 3.4, City Ordinance 24-017 is an ordinance amending the Charter of the City of Jersey City to adopt ranked choice voting as the method to elect mayor, council, school board, and subject to the approval of this ordinance by the voters to amend the city charter by binding referendum to up to be held upon, excuse me, the enactment of state legislation permitting such charter amendment. Item 3.5, City Ordinance 24-018 is an ordinance naming the Miller Branch Library Cultural Arts Center Auditorium as the Dow David Williams Cultural Arts Center in honor of Dow David Williams. And item 3.6, City Ordinance 24-019 is an ordinance amending Chapter 175, Food Handling Establishments, and Chapter 242, Peace and Good Order of the Jersey City Code of the City of Jersey City to establish regulations for third-party delivery companies and food delivery drivers. Council members are going to be taking a vote for introduction on items 3.1 through 3.6. Councilperson Ridley. Aye for introduction. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye for introduction. Councilperson Bajiano. I'm going to <clears throat> abstain on 3.4 and yes on the rest. Councilperson Soleil. Aye for introduction. Councilperson Solomon. Aye for introduction. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye for introduction. Councilperson DeGees. Aye for introduction. Councilperson Rivera. Aye for introduction. And Council President Waterman. Okay. Items 3.1 through 3.3 are introduced unanimously 9-0. Item 3.4 is introduced 8-0-1. With Councilperson Bajiano abstaining, and items 3.5 through 3.6 are introduced unanimously 9 0. Council members, since oh, oh, do we have. Stacey, you have the resolution. Would you please okay. Thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to defer to resolution 24-170. Motion to defer. Motion was made by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second. 
Second by Councilperson Rivera. On a motion to defer the resolution 24 170, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Motion carries 9-0 to defer to resolution 24-170. Okay. I'll just read it quickly. It's a resolution honoring the life of Mike Mac McManara, whereas Mike McManara has been a vital part of the city of Jersey City community since moving here in 2001. And whereas together with his wife, Allison, they welcomed their Jersey City girl, Scarlett Ray, in 2012. And whereas Mike McManara has been a pioneer of the city of Jersey City arts, playing an integral role in the cultural landscape of Jersey City. Whereas Mike McNamara, professional and accomplished photo photographer and artist, photographed the city of Jersey City and its people, places, and events over the years, including an official city portrait of Mayor Fulop, as well as photo documenting Mayor Fulop's inauguration. And whereas in 2004, Mike McNamara, co-founded the non-for-profit Fort Street Arts, promoting music and festivals as the Fort Street Art and Music Festivals, the Village Block Party, and the Ball at City Hall. And whereas the Fort Street Music and Arts Festival became a hit, attracting art and music lovers from all over the city, which ran as an annual event for over a decade. The event was open to all, including children, showcasing live music bands, art, performances, comedy acts, DJs, local cuisine, and street festivals. Now for there be resolved, the City Council of the City of Jersey City does hereby honor the life of Mike McNamara. Council members, may I take a vote on resolution 24-170. Councilperson Ridley. Uh, I just wanna say reading through this resolution, there's a, a whole lot. Um, that has been accomplished and we appreciate all that's been done for Jersey City. With that, I vote aye. Thank you, Councilperson Prinzeri. Mike will be truly missed. Um, we attended many of the events with my in-laws even before we, my husband and I officially moved back to Jersey City. Um, so with that, I vote aye. And thank you for everything. Councilperson Baggiano. Vote aye. Councilperson Soleil. Mike will truly be missed. And I recently visited the offices for, you know, the team and um, I saw his desk and um, it was really just a sad moment to see um, all the all the work that he had done for the city and the service that he did. And, you know, we definitely lost a star that I vote I. Councilperson Solomon. Um, I feel like I, um, by moving basically to the same neighborhood where Mike had lived for decades, I was sort of the very personal beneficiary of the extraordinary work he did for Jersey City, you know, all the work he did with the Village Neighborhood Association, the work he did at PS5, the work with the uh, Brunswick Community Garden, um, the arts in the village, you know, his sort of impact on my life and my family's life, uh, you know, to help build this extraordinary community was, uh, you know, real mm -hmm. and felt. Uh, and obviously his his passing is so, uh, you know, devastating, devastating for Jersey City. Uh, and I know for uh, Allison and Scarlett uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, this is kind of the honor is the least we can do. I want to thank Director Flanagan, Evelyn for really, you know, uh, ensuring that we got this resolution before us. I know that the village is going to work to restart the village block party that he uh, you know, helped create uh, years ago. And so his legacy will continue to live on. And uh, we're just very, very grateful that life brought him to Jersey City and he did so much for our city. So with that, I proudly vote aye. Thank you, Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. I vote aye. It just, we're still feeling the loss of his death and but very happy that he was able to be a part of the rekindling of the arts and culture movement downtown. 
Councilperson Rivera. A true legacy. I vote aye. And Council President Waterman. City Resolution 24-170 is approved unanimously 9-0. Brett Flanagan would like to address the council. At council, um, we invited Allison and Scarlett here tonight, along with some other members of the uh, neighborhood um, who supported Mike and Mike supported. So I just wanted them to come up to receive the resolution and get the official signed one later this week after the meeting. The camera can't be in the middle. Excuse me. She's setting up. It can't be in the middle. Have People have to walk. Thank you. Director Flanagan. Okay, council members, while we're making our way back to our seats, as per the caucus meeting on Monday, we talked about, um, we introduced actually the new first reading ordinance for the um, chapter 175 food handling establishments um, and through delivery drivers. So may I have a motion to defer to ordinance 24-008? Motion. Motion made by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilperson Solomon. On the motion to defer to Ordinance 24-008, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Thank you. He's over there. Stepped out. Okay. Oh. Councilperson Baggiano, on the motion to defer to Ordinance. There you go. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Motion carries 9-0 to defer to Ordinance 24-008. Council members, I need a motion to move to defeat Ordinance 24-008 without conducting a public hearing based on introducing Ordinance um, 24 019. Motion. Motion made by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilperson Solomon. On the motion to defeat Ordinance 24 008 without conducting a public hearing, Councilperson Ridley. Defeat, right? So I should. On a motion to defeat. Yes. Aye. Next one, we're not going to say up. Councilperson Prince Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. 
Motion carries 9-0 to move to defeat ordinance 24-008 without a public conducting a public hearing. On ordinance 24-008, Councilperson Ridley. No. Councilperson Prinzeri. No. Councilperson Bajano. Councilperson Soleil. No. Councilperson Solomon. No. Councilperson Gilmore. No. Councilperson DeGis. No. Councilperson Rivera. No. And Council President Waterman. Whew. I haven't had that many no's since I was an infant. All right. City <laughs> ordinance is defeated with zero nine. All council members voting no for ordinance 24-008. Okay, thank you so much, council members. Sean, uh, yes. On, Sean, can you just explain real briefly what just happened? Because um, I'm looking in the face of some of the people in the stands and it was sure. a little sure. Uh, confused. So if you could just explain. Absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, what we, and people, m members at home, what we did, we introduced a new ordinance replacing the second reading ordinance because the second reading ordinance would have had too many substantial changes and would have required me to re-advertise it anyway. So the cleanest way to do it is to introduce the new ordinance with all of the amendments that are in there. It contains all the amendments that were discussed with Councilperson Solomon um, and the community. And that's why we introduced it first. And that's why we went to defeat this ordinance because we introduced the first one. So the second reading, had no meaning um, and uh, we had to defeat it for the cleanest way to introduce the uh, new ordinance. Does that make sense? Good council person Gilmore. Well, we still a little confused, but the um, explanation is on the record so we can have some first. Okay. Uh, unless Councilman Solomon wants to uh, chime in. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. On to our second reading ordinances, item 4.2, City Ordinance 24-009, is an ordinance of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City adopting amendments to the Paulus Hook Redevelopment Plan and creating the Block 11606 Redevelopment Plan. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Motion, second. Motion to close a public hearing. On City Ordinance 24-009 was made by Councilperson Rivera, seconded by Councilperson Stelay. On the motion to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-009, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Motion carries 9 0 to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24 009. For final consideration and adoption of City Ordinance 24 009, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Um, just wanted to say, you know, uh, a couple things. Uh, I said this briefly at the caucus, but. Um, like, like anything, um, you know, nothing is ever perfect, but there are a couple things here that, that lead me to vote for yes um, on this. Um, the first, which is so important, is, is we just have a desperate, desperate need for affordable housing in downtown. Um, and it's been a priority of ours to, to get that. Um, and this will, will deliver 90 units, um, some with rents lower than $1,000, um, and truly uh, create, you know, opportunity for 90 families, access to great schools, transit, um, things like that. Um, Desperate need for open space. We're going to get a 12,000 square foot park uh, through this, uh, including a dog run, which we don't really have a public dog run anywhere in the vicinity of the neighborhood. Um, and then uh, full taxes, no tax abatement, um, and that will help deal with the, to the tax burden that's being put on property owners. So all of those things get me to a yes, and so that's why I vote yes. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. City Ordinance 24 009 is adopted unanimously 9 0. On to our next second reading ordinance, 
Item 4.3, City Ordinance 24-012, is an ordinance of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City adopting amendments to the Liberty Harbor North redevelopment plan regarding use and bulk standards on tax block 15907, also known as block 24 of the redevelopment plan. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Good evening, Council President, Council Members, Mr. Kirk, Gerard. Piz My name is Gerard Pizzillo. I'm an attorney with Genova Burns. I'm appearing this evening on behalf of uh, an adjacent, adjacent property owner, LHN Owner Urban Renewal LLC and LHN2 LLC. Um, and we're appearing before you to ask and respectfully uh, defeat this proposed ordinance. Um, although it comes after a recommendation and referral from the planning board, I think there are still legitimate concerns and issues with the proposed height of this building. Um, and despite the limiting language in the resolution, because of the existing language in the redevelopment plan that will remain, even if this amendment were to be adopted, the st proposed structure would be greater and, and a lot larger than what's really intended. And it would adopting this proposed redevelopment plan uh, would essentially pave the way for an as of right building that is a lot higher than really what is anticipated for for those reasons we would respectfully request that this board or this council uh, reject the proposed amendment and defeat it thank you this is still a public hearing your name for the record Good evening, Gregory Asadorian from the law firm of uh, Dakotas, Fitzpatrick Cole Giblin. I represent the property owner, Liberty Harbor North Partners LLC. A um, couple things I want to say. Firstly, this property has been vacant for over 20 years. The Liberty Harbor North uh, refund plan was adopted in 2001. It's now been over two decades and this property remains vacant. Um, this council has approved the redevelopment plan and um, several amendments to it. And what was permitted there for all these years was a hotel. It was a hotel, 16 story hotel with a with a height. What we are proposing is that the hotel remain a permitted use. And in addition to the hotel, a 32 story residential building be permitted not to exceed the height of the hotel. Um, I know you just heard Mr. Brazillo tell you that this Building's going to be taller. It is not. It's going to be the same exact height of the hotel. The only thing that we're asking is that, in addition to a hotel, a residential building also be permitted with the same height. So the shadow or the height or the structure of the building, the footprint, it will all be the same. The only thing we're saying is add residential to the use. Now, if the residential is added, I think it's important for this body to know that the Liberty Harbor North Redevelopment Plan has been around since 2001. It's 84 acres. Out of those 84 acres, there are zero affordable housing units. This project is proposing 15% set aside, which is 45 units. That means 45 families that cannot afford or live in the Liberty Harbor North District Redevelopment Plan will now have an opportunity to live there. And if you look at this city's master plan and the housing plan, the master plan land use element, November 2021. And I need to just bring this to your attention to show you how this proposed project complies with the master plan. Your master plan says on page 45, nearly half the land in the Liberty Harbor North and Grand Jersey is vacant or underimproved. This will develop it. Division of Community Development works to preserve and increase Jersey City's affordable housing stock. That's page 52. This will propose 45 affordable units where zero exist. Redevelopment is a key land use tool to promote revitalization that are unlikely to be addressed by existing market forces. That's page 79 of your master plan. That speaks specifically to this project. Over 20 years, no development. This will help develop this project. Page 85, construction of housing is booming but cannot keep up with regional demand. That's what this will do. It will help keep up with regional demand. And probably most importantly, page 176 of this city's master plan, 
I'm up. Thank you. May I just add? Says city has a significant need. Time is up. That's it. This is still a public hearing on this ordinance. And Good evening. This is uh, my name is Ralph Salermo. I am a principal in Liberty Harbor North uh, Partners, the developer of uh, the proposed uh, amendment this evening. Um, I appreciate the, the council's time and allowing me to speak. Um, this is a classic story of uh, David and Goliath. You know, have J.P. Morgan trying to block this development um, that is basically no larger than what would be permitted if it were a hotel, and it is much shorter than the properties that they have towering over this vacant lot that sat for 20 years. Um, I've been working in communities. I'm a minority developer. I've been working in communities like Jersey City, and have worked in Jersey City, putting. Uh, minorities and residents to work and this is a tremendous opportunity for affordable housing in a redevelopment area that has none um and i'm committed to this project and i appreciate your support thank you can i get a better understanding libby harbor north is that going in from johnson avenue down into libby park is that where we at on that side or just on the other side downtown by grand street It's near the. It's it's like a block away from where the Boys and Girls Club is. If you know where the Boys and Girls, yeah, club is. it's like about yeah. a block away from that. Yeah. Uh, so this is the group that brought the Boys Club out and moved them down from where they was on Grand. This ain't the same group. Not not the same group. It's just near there, but not the same group. It's near the new Boys Club at where they moved to. Okay. So the plan is they don't want no affordable housing down there. But we're gonna put some down there. You understand that? That's that's the next step. We all don't want my mouth no more tonight. Okay. About that project. Thank you. Thanks, Lebron. This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-012. Any member of the public wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Good evening, council members. Good evening. My name is Dean Marchetto. I'm the architect for the uh, applicant. Uh, I just wanted to say that this block down in Liberty Harbor North uh, is a regular 200 by 400 foot block. There are two 45 story towers on the block and there's a third footprint for a tower. As the lawyer had said, Greg, uh, that there is a, a hotel plan for this. The hotel is allowed to be 340 feet tall and it's a 16 story hotel. They anticipated taller floor heights. I have two exhibits. This is a scale model of a 340 foot hotel showing 16, uh, 16 stories. This is a model of the residential building we propose. It's exactly the same height and feet. They're both 340 uh, uh, feet tall. The difference is that the floor to floor heights here are residential. They're about nine foot eight or 10 foot feet, uh, 10 feet floor to floor. So I can fit more floors in residential use in this box than the floors that are allowed in this box, just by making the floor to floor heights more like a normal residential floor to floor height, changing the use from hotel to residential without increasing the height. Um, and by doing so, the additional floors will allow us to provide 45 units of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-012. Any members of the public still wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Motion. That's it. I just wanted to correct myself, Dean Marchetto again. It's not that we're changing the use, we're allowing an additional use. The hotel can still go if a hotel developer comes. After 20 years, no one has come to build a hotel. We're just saying that besides the hotel, we would like to be able to choose residential, which okay. would allow the affordable housing. Nothing's changing. Motion, second. Thank you. Motion to close the public hearing on city ordinance 24-012 was made by... Councilperson Rivera, and thank you. Seconded by Councilperson Soleil. On the motion to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-012, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bajiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. 
and Council President Waterman. Aye. Motion carries 9-0 to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-012. For final consideration and adoption of City Ordinance 24-012, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Uh, is this the final vote? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yes, we voted on this once before and we've been asked to do it again, so I vote aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGees. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Aye. City Ordinance 24-012 is adopted unanimously 9-0. On to our last second reading ordinance, item 4.4, City Ordinance 24-013 is an ordinance supplementing Chapter 332, Vehicles and Traffic, Article 2, Traffic Regulations, Section 332-8, Prohibited Right Turns on Red Signal to Prohibit Turns on Red at All Times at Multiple Locations in proximity to schools and parks in the Heights neighborhood. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. I am Chelsea Plesnitzer. Just give me one second, Chelsea, I'm sorry. Just gotta get the camera on you and set the clock. Ready? My name is Chelsea Plesnitzer, a mom of two kids and a member of the JC Heights Parents who represents the community group's interest in improving street safety for all road users. We want to sincerely thank the Department of Infrastructure, Director Patel, Mayor Phillip, Councilman Saleh, Salman, and Baggiano, and JCPD North Captain Peterson for working with us in this mission to make our streets safer since our campaign started two months ago and working to pass the No Right on Red Ordinance in the Heights. We also want to thank the 1,400 plus residents who signed the petition and countless organizations and local businesses who amplified our call for change. We want to make this clear. This is a matter of urgency urgent public health crisis. While we appreciate this ordinance, this is a call for more. Between December and January, there were four hit and runs that we know of, two in the Heights, one was fatal, one involved a child, and one was witnessed by a fellow mom who was inspired to start this campaign. There are countless near misses every day. This issue, issue hits closer and closer to home. Two weeks ago, a mother was hit downtown dropping her, off her daughter at school by a car who simply couldn't see the stop sign due to cars blocking the view. Later that evening, a mother parks, parks car was hit as she was unloading groceries on Summit Avenue in the Heights, traumatizing both her and her daughter in the process. Truly, our worst fears are coming true. We want to set all road users up for success because guess what? We're not only scared for our lives and our children's lives, but we're afraid of being the cause of someone else getting injured or worse. This is a public health hazard. We're parents seeking solutions, not experts. In short, we want to see the following. We need more resources put towards reckoning with growing with the growing epidemic. On the infrastructure side, we need to increase staffing and project budget with dedicated resources per ward and employed a tiered system level response to residents' requests for intersection improvements so a level of safety can be provided immediately. On the enforcement side, there's a large discrepancy between the municipal budget allocation and the level of patrolling personnel to combat issues of traffic violence which we urge you to look into. While we believe we should focus on enforcement as the last line of defense and double down on effective traffic engineering as a first, enabling a traffic unit would be key to a zero tolerance policy on offensive driving and parking behaviors to change our toxic driving culture. We need, an, we need your unwavering political backing to raise this issue on a priority list. You need to set the bar of what our road should look like, feel like, and where the negotiation should begin should there be pushback. As an example, Hoboken, New Jersey was able to achieve unprecedented results in their Vision Zero program due to their firm commitment. You have the real power to amplify this conversation and seek what will take our Vision Zero strategy and all of the amazing things we have been accomplished thus far to the next level. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-013. Mandy Spangler. I'm sorry, your name again? Mandy Spangler. Okay. Good evening, Council. I am a mother of two and Heights resident for eight years. 
My husband and I are greatly invested in this community. Today, I put my aversion to public speaking aside for my family and my fellow neighbor. I support Ordinance 24-013 and encourage you to implement the same in all Jersey City wards. However, this ordinance is a drop in the bucket in terms of what is required to meet the needs of your constituents. This is what I experience as a resident in the height every day. Red lights are broken with alarming frequency and predictability. Vehicles barrel down our populous streets at hazardous speeds stop and no turn on red signs are treated as a suggestion. Crosswalks are blocked and obscured by vehicles parking or idling irresponsibly. No passing zones are not observed. You must assume the rules of the road will not be followed and you must achieve eye contact with drivers prior to availing of your right of way. The toxic driver behavior has led to my husband and I experiencing near misses that are disturbing, both independently and with our children in tow. What we encounter is a shared reality for the pedestrians in the Heights. I believe the issue stems from multiple factors, ineffective road design and traffic engineering, setting even the most responsible driver up to fail. Lack of a holistic approach to change and piecemeal implementation of improvements. Insufficient levels of enforcement creating an anything goes environment. Although Jersey City has led the way with adopting Vision Zero, implementation seems to have stalled. So now I stand here and I plead with you to use the power afforded to you to ju not just do better. I implore you to drive the momentum needed for a swift transformation to the face of pedestrian safety in the Heights and all of Jersey City. I fail to see the downside of making Jersey City a safe place to walk. Lastly, to quote Mayor Fulop, it is our duty to protect the lives of all residents, employees and visitors of our great city. Thank you. Thank you. Still a public hearing. Good evening. Uh, my name is Maria Kinberg, and I'm the president of the Riverview Neighborhood Association. The Riverview Neighborhood Association, we're an association in Ward D in the Heights, and our mission is to work with community members to improve quality of life in the Heights neighborhood. So we, um, we support the No Right on Red Ordinance, um, and we want to thank the JC Heights Parents Group for bringing this up and advocating for safe streets. And we also think that we also want to support adopting this as a citywide initiative. Uh, that seems like something the council could do. We also endorse the petition that the JC Heights parents groups put forward. Um, there are so many things that we can do to improve the safety of our streets. Uh, some of the things that were in that petition that we support as well, traffic lights, stop signs, speed humps, um, changes to the speed zone to reduce traffic fatalities, um, no parking on crosswalks, and as was stated, enforcement. Enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. If we do not enforce the laws we, and we implement them, then we're not doing anything. And I think that's what we see in the Heights every day when people go through stop signs, don't, go at, you know, don't stop at red lights. This happens constantly. So we absolutely have to work with the police force and get them on board when we're making these changes to ensure that these changes are actually enforced and we can see the improvements in quality of life. Um, and then, you know, to exactly what was said in terms of, you know, continuing with Vision Zero and making sure that we're implementing that plan as quickly as possible. Um, we're here to improve quality of life in the Heights. And unfortunately, when we do not have safe streets, we're seeing fatalities as was, as was said as well. So we want you to do as much as you can as soon as possible. So thank you so much um, for this opportunity to speak. This is still a public hearing. Hello, uh, I'm Jonas uh, from the Heights, Jonas Thankovich. Uh, I live on Palisade and Franklin in the Heights. And uh, Palisade is, Avenue is a really, really busy street. It's like a, it's like a zoo, especially during rush hour. 
and uh, I walk my dog all the time. And um, uh, people making right on reds, it's got to be the most dangerous uh, uh, traffic violation, tra traffic issue, um, because what'll happen is uh, people don't stop at the white line. They'll go past the white line into the crosswalk to look to make their right on red. And so a lot of times, especially at night, I'll be trying to cross in the crosswalk and they won't see me. Uh, and I've had so many near misses. I, I, I hope I'll still be around to see this pass, um, but it, it's very, very dangerous. Uh, and I can only imagine what it would be like for kids, you know, people who are who are not as easy to be to be seen by drivers. Um, and so um, I think this is a great first step. Uh, the other thing to think about is, I mean, uh, uh, following these these traffic rules is largely an honor system here, I've noticed. Um, and I see people all all the time go through stop signs, go through red lights, uh, go over the speed limit. They have really loud vehicles sometimes too, and they just barrel down Palisade. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, it's great to pass a, a, a law to do this. Um, I don't know how well it's going to get enforced though, uh, because obeying the traffic laws in this city is an honor system. And some people are really good about that. Uh, some people don't want to follow the rules. Um, so I just urge you uh, to pass this, uh, to think of it as a first step, and then uh, to start the hard work of thinking how we can make the streets safer. Thanks. Thank you. Still a public hearing? So you got to come a little closer to the mic and raise the mic and state your name for the record, please. Hello, I'm Crystal Pickens. I'm a resident of Ward B and I have been for over 10 years. Um, I have two kids ages seven and three who we walk to school and around the city every day. On January 17th, 2.25 p.m., my husband Pat was hit by a car. It was a clear and beautiful sunny day. Although we'd recently had snow, the roads were perfectly clear. Pat was pushing our stroller on his way to pick up our youngest child from school when he was struck in a crosswalk on Westside Avenue. When he called me after he was hit, I was shocked and scared, and I honestly didn't know what to do. So I called one of my best friends whose husband was hit by a car several years ago, also in Jersey City. Because she'd been through it, I knew she would know what to do. What are the odds that a close friend has been in this exact scenario? In Jersey City these days, it's starting to feel more and more common that this would be the case. We probably all know at least one person who has had at least a close call with a pedestrian and car incident, if not worse. This is not okay. Physically, my husband is now mostly okay, though he's still not comfortable walking our three-year-old to school. Our stroller was broken from the impact, and there's a lot of spiraling that we can go through as parents when something like this happens, and we think about the details. Our family experienced a trauma that day, and we are still experiencing the effects, and I imagine we will be for a while. We need to have better systems in place to slow down drivers, to make drivers more aware, make pedestrians more aware, increase visibility, and make our community safer. We need to fast track any plans that will help us achieve Vision Zero across all areas of Jersey City. Here are some ways that we can do that. First, I'd like to say I'm in full support of this ordinance for no turn on red, and I would love to see it expanded throughout the entire city as soon as possible. Second, if we can create comprehensive daylighting at the approaches to intersections, this can be extremely beneficial to increasing visibility at crosswalks. Third, some of our lights have automatic crosswalks signals when you come to the light, but many of them don't. We should change this so that they're all included. And lights um, and intersections where there aren't lights should include flashing push buttons for pedestrians. And finally, we need more enforcement for both parking violations and moving violations around intersections and crosswalks. When we start regularly having some consequences for these types of issues, we will likely start to see a change in these behaviors. In closing, I know that people make mistakes and things will still happen, but with better infrastructure and better systems in place to support our community, we can all feel a little safer when we're walking around our neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. Good evening, my name is Megan Carolyn. I am also uh, a resident of Ward B and I'm the friend who received the phone call because I have also been through this before. My husband was hit by a car at the intersection of JFK and SIP about four years ago. Um, 
That car was making a left turn. He was crossing. The car was turning left. They both had the green. The car should have yielded, and he didn't. We were told at the scene that, thank God, the driver stopped because if they'd continued going, my husband likely would have been seriously injured or possibly killed. Crystal's husband was struck while the car was going, I believe, straight. Right on red and getting rid of it in select or even all neighborhoods is phenomenal. And I'm largely, you know, so in favor of this ordinance. But I really just want to drive home the, the point that it is a first step. It's a drop in the bucket. Um, high speed impacts are what kill people. And when people are able to hit higher speeds on straightaways like JFK, which is not designed like a local road, those uh, crashes are more and, and more damaging. I know that when we talk about you know, JFK, for example, it's this hot potato, right? It's a county road. It's so much harder to make change there. But when we look at really where people are, are injured and killed, JFK is a spot that needs a lot, a lot more uh, intervention. I also just want to give an acknowledgement to the JC Heights Parents Group because you all did tremendous, tremendous work that's giving all of us momentum in the community now. I knew that you all were working on this, but to hear that in two months from a petition, we're here today with an ordinance, I mean, just really incredible, incredible work to all of you. There's really, there, the best time to have made these road changes was yesterday. The next best time is right now. And seeing this starting tonight is empowering. And I hope the community continues this momentum to move forward throughout the whole city. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Hi, my name is Alexa Weibel. Uh, and I'm here to support the No Right on Red ordinance because it feels like my life depends on it. I moved to Jersey City a few months before my son Sebastian was born in 2021. I loved my life in Brooklyn. I'm an editor at the New York Times and a diehard New Yorker. I'd never envisioned moving to New Jersey, but I had friends who lived in Jersey City and they encouraged me to come visit. And I fell in love with visions of life here with my family. Strolls overlooking Manhattan at Riverview Fisk Park, Saturdays at Liberty Science Center, the convenience of a smooth commute to Manhattan, a lovely city with diversity and activities and history and beauty. I've been mugged at knife point in New York City and assaulted another time when someone punched me in the face and ran off with my purse. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel more unsafe walking on the streets of Jersey City and specifically my neighborhood in the Heights than I did overall in the streets in Brooklyn. I've been clipped pushing my stroller around as someone raced through a red light at a corner next to Pershing Field. I live on JFK Boulevard, also known as the Boulevard of Death, and I've heard more crashes than I can count on one hand in the three short lives that I, years that I've lived here. I wrapped holiday lights on my son's stroller for the holidays in late November and only begrudgingly allowed my husband to take them off three months later. I was comforted by the idea that they might increase visibility and keep Seb safer, offer a tiny bit of protection in their glow. Other parents followed suit, admitting they felt safer with lights on their strollers. I feel like I need to wait to excuse me, I need to wave and make obvious eye contact with drivers before I step into the street, even at crosswalks and stoplights, because I've seen so many drivers drive so recklessly, rolling through stop signs, whizzing through red lights, and speeding around corners. My overall experience becoming a proud inhabitant of Jersey City has been wonderful. We found a loving, supportive community, and we've made the routines we dreamed of and have found joy, culture, and community here. But neither this city nor its inhabitants can thrive without some basic expectation of safety. We shouldn't live with fear to cross these streets. Please pass the no turn on red ordinance and continue to make pedestrian safety a top priority because our lives depend on it. Thank you. Our next speaker. Good evening. My name is Dr. Jennifer Marin, and I am here to support the No Right on Red ordinance. I have been a member of the downtown community for 13 years, and I am coming up on my 10-year anniversary when I was struck by a car at 6th and Marin. Luckily, I was okay. Um, it was really scary, but... I feel like in these past 13 years, crossing the street has just felt more and more unsafe. I support this ordinance. When I heard about this rally, it just felt like it was a really good reason to bring my daughter for to justify why she sees me get really angry and yell at, at people on the streets when we're crossing. Um, I guess it's just my weird mom guilt, but this is not enough. It's going to take a lot more. I don't have a ton of solutions to propose here. Um, I'm just here to 
just share my support. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Karin von Oppen. I am um, in 2001. I um, was crossing the street uh, for where I used to live to go the wide street that is uh, by the Hall Tunnel. And I had the green and the other person had the green as well, but he was turning and he just didn't look at me. He was watching where he was going to take gas. So that's that long ago. And then I fear that not only has nothing changed, it's got so much worse. Um, another example, uh, Montgomery seems to be the street, although it has the um, uh, traf um, sorry, bike lane among bikes a lot. Where I get most into trouble, I was going to the post office and um, where you are at to turn to go into um, at, uh, St. Peter's uh, or St. Peter's Prep. I was going straight. That lady, of course, had a green, but she turned and she almost ran me over. And I told her she had her window down and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going straight. I have the green. And she's no, you need to look for me. I'm like, I do not. That's not how that works. You can go once I pass and too many drivers just they feel like they're in the car and they go first. That's it. And uh, today I was on the opposite direction, Montgomery going towards Bergen Avenue. I got hit. I didn't get hit, luckily, but it came close twice in like minutes. Um, oh, the second time was the worst. It's on a street I can barely pronounce, Tours Avenue, I think. It goes, um, and it was early in the morning, um, and, a, and a truck just ran, I don't know how fast, like I'm, I'm surprised that his, his wheels didn't go up. And I just had to make sure that I didn't land under that truck. That just shouldn't be the case. I'm so glad that this is happening. I'm glad for the parents in, in the Heights that something is getting done. And I'm glad that they are advocating for the whole city for things to change. Thank you. This is still a public hearing. The next speaker. Hi, Tony Borelli, Vice President of Bike JC. I'll just briefly register our organization's strong support for all of the measures under consideration here tonight, and also for all of the uh, more comprehensive and widespread measures for which you've heard unanimous support here tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Sue. I'm here with my son, Jacob. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, your, your, your first name? Brian. Brian? Brian. Brian. Yeah. Um, Jacob was uh, struck by a hit and run driver about two months ago at Grove and Grand. Um, this is an update. He's recovering well. He finally got the cast took, taken off and is in a boot back in school doing well. Um, but I also fully support um, any changes that improve traffic safety, pedestrian safety in Jersey City. Um, I hope that we can have a no right turn on red ordinance throughout the city um, and I'm just fully in support of this. Thank you. This is still a public hearing on city ordinance 24-013. Our next speaker. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Javier Guedes. I'm a resident of the Heights. Thank you very much for, uh, for allowing me to speak to you today. <clears throat> So I'm in support of the uh, no right turn on red uh, ordinance. I think it's a terrific program. Um, however, I think we have to do more. Uh, the, the heights, um, traffic safety is horrendous. Uh, walking to the central and going to a restaurant is just an ordeal. But um, I think there's a bigger problem. Um, and the utility companies are just destroying the streets. You pave the streets, they come in this. So please do better because you know safe, that's a big safety concern. The cars are going faster, they lose control. I mean, there's so many things. <clears throat> but anyways, thank you very much. I, I think we have to do more. Um, I understand that the Department of Infrastru Infrastructure is here. We would like for you to call on them to hear from them what they have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.
This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-013. All right, my name is Sam Ortiz. As you can see, I'm a school officer and school traffic guard for Georgia City. It's becoming increasingly difficult, and I really need your support. Uh, I support the organs of No Turn on Red, and uh, No Turn on Red at all schools on must be must be at joint school sections. Majority of drivers are all over from new, from neighboring city borderline out of state that comes into Georgia City, Main Street, JFK, Communipore, Montgomery, etc. From Union City, Secaucus, Kearney, and beyond, and New York City, especially ghost tags, vehicles that had temporary pl paper plates attached that are the majority concern of driving behavior through Jersey City neighborhood pedestrian. They have no regard to traffic laws or yield safety regulation, let alone failure to yield, failure to turn signal, or no indication, no seatbelt texting while driving, under influence upon driving, intoxication while driving, underage driving, non-elderly handicapped place drivers do not comply upon complete stop and most importantly, international drivers unable to understand traffic rules. The lack of visual display on street sign and need speed indication bumps on every school zone inter intersection. Again, thank you for your time and courtesy. Amy, Pagano, Witterman, thank you. This is still a public hearing. Our next speaker. Hi, I'm Rebecca Sanchez um, and I'm in the Heights and I just wanted to get my support here for everything that needs to be done to make our uh, just our city better. Um, it's hard because I'm a stay at home mom and I, I walk with my kids all the time all over and um, even with the lights, it's hard for me to really trust that cars are going to actually stop and, you know, take and actually wait for me to cross the street with my kids. Um, and I always tell my kids, I, we, you need to be so close to me because I'm just that, I, I've seen it all, I've seen it like countless times where drivers will just go and think that they can just, you know, basically almost run you over. Um, and I just wanted to put my support for this and anything we can do to move forward uh, would be great. Thank you. Thank you. This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-013. Any member of the public still wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Hello, I'm Talia Schwartz. I'm uh, president of Safe Streets JC. I want to thank the council for pushing forward with the no turn on red ordinance in the Heights. This is a great first step. Uh, like everyone else here, I want to support that and I want to say it's not enough. Um, it's it's just not enough to address the driving behavior in the city. On my way here, I watched a pedestrian try and cross Christopher Columbus Drive. He had a green light uh, when a car turning left honked at him for being in the way and then he r scuttled back to the corner uh, and did not cross the street. He was bullied by a car driver. Things are getting worse. Every single person, including I'm sure all of you sitting in this room, has a story about driver aggression. We had four deaths and many injuries caused by cars on city streets last year, all on streets that are well known to be dangerous and have not received Vision Zero improvements. As a reminder to this council, fewer than 40% of the people in the city use cars to commute to work. So the vast majority of us are walking the streets and we are being terrorized by dangerous drivers. I live on the west side, and thanks to Councilwoman Prinzeri and the city transportation and planning teams, Duncan Ave was utterly transformed this year. This is a road where a teenage girl was killed by a car just a few years ago and is part of the high injury network. If studies were done now on Duncan Ave, it would be clear that cars are driving the actual speed limit and you can watch kids safely cross the street thanks to design changes, including daylighting, bike lanes, and other intersection management. Uh, 
I'm here to ask for this treatment throughout the entire city, across the entire high injury network first, near all the transportation hubs, parks, and schools. This no turn on red light ordinance will be helpful, but we need to shift resources to the planning and transportation team so they can make more improvements quickly. As the president of Safe Streets JC, I get emails from residents asking for help to make their neighborhood safe. Often they've already tried other things and are desperate for help. Calls for more enforcement, removing violations have gone unanswered from the police saying they don't have the manpower. With 900 police officers, Jersey City definitely has the manpower to address this public safety crisis. Finally, we ask that our council recognize the danger cars are to everyone who is walking the streets and take the problem more seriously. We should make no turn on red throughout the whole city. We are a highly urban and pedestrian environment. We need the city council to push for more improvements like banning left turns, lowering the speed limits and create one way streets. We are a busy city with a lot of people using the sidewalks and the streets, not just the cars. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. How you doing? Greg Nadler. Um, just want to share a personal experience. So for the last seven years, I've been living in the Heights. For the last two of those, every morning I take my son to daycare. Uh, I have to cross Palisade Ave one time. There are two crosswalks, one of which I don't even use because I don't trust cars to stop. It's right in front of one of the lights that one of this band is uh, proposed for. Uh, and I'm just worried cars are going to try to catch a light and hit me and not care. Uh, the other one is um, typically blocked by some sort of delivery van. Uh, this morning was the first time I had to take my daughter, who's five months old, to school. Once again, there was a delivery van parked, uh, not just blocking the vision from the crosswalk, but literally over it. Uh, so I went around the van, which meant I had to jaywalk. And then I was yelled at by a vehicle for jaywalking. So I don't know what the answer is. I just know there's a problem specifically in the Heights and I think this ordinance can help. Thank you. Good evening, Council President, members of Council. Uh, Jimmy Lee on the board of Safe Streets JC. Um, I wanna express support for expansion of No Turn On Red. This is another common sense improvement. It just makes sense. It's something Turn on red is something appropriate for rural areas and not appropriate for a busy city with many people. We've all experienced it. You want to cross at a stoplight uh, from the right, but a car is already pulled ahead, blocking the crosswalk. The driver's looking left and doesn't even notice you trying to cross. But as you can see from the comments tonight, we need to go much further. And this only begins to chip away at the problem. Statistically, that makes sense. Left turns, for example, are very dangerous and 17 times more dangerous than right turns. Drivers are not yielding on green, left or right. Um, drivers are all running stop signs or intersections with no stop signs and folks standing in crosswalks. We need accelerated safe streets improvements. And I reiterate those calls for universal daylighting. That's something that's accessible, simple, cheap, and just blocks people from doing something that is already illegal. In nowhere in New Jersey is it legal to pop to park within 25 feet of that intersection. Um, that daylighting can be the difference between uh, life and death. Um, I also want to just reiterate calls in order to achieve these accelerated improvements. Uh, I think we need more staff and funding to build those quick build improvements. Uh, I asked the council look into um, uh, improving the, the budgeting for the transportation department. Um, and second, I also want to reiterate all the calls for traffic enforcement. I especially thankful for all the crossing guards around the city uh, and and for the crossing guards that are here with us tonight. They're often disrespected. Uh, they don't have enforcement power by themselves. And uh, I, I would ask for traffic enforcement and traffic enforcement paired with crossing guards in order to uh, increase uh, uh, compliance with, with their important directions. So yeah, I stand in sol solidarity with uh, all the folks in the Heights. Um, this is basic dignity and a basic right for us to travel safely from point A to point B in our city. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Tina Knowles. Um, 
I was just actually just going over this, which I had did no turn, no right turns on red. Um, I'm not from Jersey City, but I've been living here for a long time. I know that we created up on the hill, them big bump, nasty roll. Nothing have ever changed since then. Education and Gilmore, you know, um, Jermaine, I believe, was here because his son got killed on Boswick. I believe Kim, her son got killed too because of what happened and stuff. I don't know exactly what y'all going to do, if it's going to make sense of making no right turns or which way that y'all could do so some of the kids or some of the adults won't get hurt and stuff like that. So this is a good touching of what's going Going on in our community, a lot of kids and a lot of adults are getting hurt. So we just need to find another way of what it is. And I believe it's just so much. It's like many New York. Look how New York is. A lot of people came from New Yorkers over here and they are speeding and stuff. That's not the community no more like it used to be for housing and family and stuff like this. This is like now many New York not Jersey City. So I don't know what we're going to do. And we definitely overpack with all the cars here in Jersey City. I'm in War F, so I definitely know. And you know that too in War F as going around with the bikes. Look at Jackson Avenue. You barely can't even ride past because we got the people riding the bikes and we got the cars. I mean, when they designed this, they designed it some kind of way. So I don't know what y'all going to do. And I pray that y'all do the finer things and make sure everything is good so families and everything can get the help they need. Motion. This is still a public hearing on City Ordinance 24-013. Any member of the public still wishing to be heard, please come up to the podium and state your name for the record. Motion. So motion to close the public hearing was originally made by Council President Waterman. And I'll give the second to Council Person Rivera. On the motion to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-013, Council Person Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bajano. Aye. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Aye. Motion carries 9 0 to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24 013. For final consideration and adoption of City Ordinance 24 013, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. I just want to thank um, all the advocates for the work that you all have done here. It's remarkable. Um, I want to thank our Department of Infrastructure. You guys do an amazing job with coming up with short term and long term solutions to the problems that we have here on our streets. We're a growing city. We have over a million cars come through on a regular basis because of our proximity to New York, not just our own residents that live here. Um, and thank you too for those that shared their stories that were very painful. We appreciate that you took the time to do that. I know that that takes some courage as well. Um, and for those on the west side, we are working on improvements on Mal not only Mallory and west side, but also coming up along Bergen and Monticello. So if you have other ideas, please do reach out to me. You guys live on your streets. You know what's best for your corners the same way that I know what's best for mine. With that, I vote aye. Councilperson Bargiano. I agree with everyone that got up here and spoke, and I'm going to tell you something. The real problem is in the police department. We don't have any motorcycles. We don't have any walking cops. And when I was on the police department, we had close to 1,200 cops, but they were out in the street issuing summonses. Now you see a radio car sit there, a person runs a red light. They don't do nothing because they're told not to. Uh, some of the politicians in the state have got to start having laws enforced and stop this BS. I, I speak to most of the cops and I feel sorry for them. Uh, as I said, I spent 36 years in the Jersey City Police Department and then never, never, never saw anything like what's going on today. So I vote yes. Councilperson Soleil. So tonight I want to thank my friends, my neighbors, my residents, um, everyone in Jersey City that came to advocate for this. I want to thank the Department of Infrastructure for their hard work proposing this. This was something that was in the works and being discussed, but without your support, without you guys coming and saying we want this done, you know, it would have faced a lot more resistance. And that's why we appreciate 
when the community comes out and they voice their support for measures, it makes everyone's job a lot easier. And we do need to see this citywide um, because people's lives are at risk. I know for myself and I know a lot of people shared their stories when I was five or six, I was crossing with my dad um, on Central Avenue and Congress Street. So a drive, a car, a sports car was coming up Congress Street, makes the right on red. And back then there was a no right turn on red sign. It didn't exist. And then he hits me and my dad and my dad <laughs> um, literally cursed him out and then he cursed out my dad and then they get into a fight and then he <laughs> they're ripping each other's shirts and punching each other it was just like it was chaos this was when i was five or six years old and um my sister got hit by a car in congress and new york avenue this uh this car just drove through a stop sign um going down new york avenue and then hit another car jumped the curb pinned her to a tree while she was a pedestrian um, and then the firefighters came out to save her life. And this was before she was supposed to get married. Um, these are really pressing issues and your advocacy today can make the difference in someone living and not living, someone having a life of disability and someone being able to see their next child's birthday because people come to the heights to, you know, raise their families to plant roots. We have a lot of long-term residents there, but we also have a lot of newcomers uh, that are coming to the area to raise their families. And it's a very, very diverse ward. And, you know, this is one of the measures that we need to get done, not just here, but citywide. Um, we also need to discuss lowering the speed limit near the school zones. Um, and I know the Department of Infrastructure has brought that forward and I bring that to everyone here and I propose it and I let it out into the universe to bring it down to 15 miles an hour around school zones. We need um, better mass transit. We need um, possibly bus lane or a light rail on Kennedy Boulevard, because the less cars we have on the road, the safer it is for everybody. We need more daylighting and it should be um, built into every infrastructure project that we have citywide. If they're doing a sewer project, they got to tear up the roads. We should automatically be installing these uh, larger curbs so that people don't park and reduce visibility for other people. Um, we need more enforcement, uh, as Mo Kinberg said, and um, I agree with everyone that said we need more enforcement, especially Bojano. Um, <laughs> we need, I, I implore everyone here to go to their captain's meetings and to make their voices heard because the Heights parents group, they went to the captain's meeting. They're getting 24 summonses a month for traffic infractions, and that's gone up to over 300 in the north. And we need more of that. We need more enforcement on the local level for these infractions. That's the only way. There was a hit and run on uh, North Street and Webster um, near the park. And that necessitated, um, we, we did a traffic study around there, but we asked for more enforcement after the parents went to the captain's meeting and then they put two undercover cop cars there and they they were giving out summonses left and right to everyone that was going through the stop sign. I think crossing guards should have body cameras and they should be able to write the tickets remotely as well. So that's that's just, some of the ideas, but I know that we could achieve this safer streets if we work together and we bring our collective energies to the fore and then we advocate like this, we can accomplish so, so much. And this is 
just the beginning of the beginning. Uh, I'm going to realize this dream of safer streets with you. We're throwing in more speed humps, more stop signs. We're doing more of the flashing beacons. We're going to do more of these policy proposals as well. With that, I vote aye. Thank you. Councilperson Solomon. For, um, I'm going to proudly vote aye. Um, first, thank my colleagues, Councilman Slay, Councilman Bogiano, for working on this for the Heights. Thank the Department of Infrastructure for their work. Um, I try to meet with them so much that they sometimes tell me I can't meet with them because I keep wanting to meet with them on streets and they restrict my time, but I understand why because they have a whole city to take care of. But most importantly, a thank you to the parents who have really elevated this, all the community members in the Heights, downtown, west side, and across the city uh, because as you say, and 100% and right, as lives are at stake. Um, and every time that we're able to put these safety improvements in, we don't know who, what family is being saved, but there's a family being saved, immense trauma um, over the course of, of years. So, uh, you know, I think some of the proudest work that I've done is, is at times taking streets that I know people have been seriously hurt or killed at and putting improvements in and making those safer, but also knowing and listening and hearing from residents downtown and across the city that way, way more has to be done yet. Um, and so count me fully on board for the list of initiatives that were discussed here, whether it's enforcement, whether it's additional uh, daylighting, whether it's additional road diets, whether it's lowering the speed limit to 20 miles an hour, whether it's a citywide ban on right on red. I'm fully on board with all those initiatives. I want to serve as an ally and a leader. So reach out to me and thank you all for your work and glad to see this change coming and many more in the future. Councilperson Gilmore. Um, just want to thank everyone for coming out, voicing their concerns as it relates to street safety in this particular ordinance. Um, but I guess for me, the reality is we can put as many laws on a book as we want to. If you don't have any enforcement, it's not going to work. People are not stopping at stop signs. They're not going to care about no right on red. The issue is enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And less than until we have, have real serious conversation about enforcement, this is just going to be ceremonial. That's it. So I vote, I vote I in light of all that. And I just, in my heart, I just really hope we can really get around to some enforcement. Councilperson DeGees. I proudly vote aye. I want to thank the groups that came together and not only presented this to the council and to the rights departments, but petitioned and organized for it. And I think going throughout the city is going to take some work, but this does need to happen in more neighborhoods. And I look forward to continuing working with those groups and the great departments that put the work to good use and make sure that our streets are safe. So I vote aye. Councilperson Rivera. Yeah, to everybody that came out here, I mean, you guys are amazing. Uh, we hear you 100% uh, to the to my council colleagues who uh, who helped write this uh, this ordinance. You know, uh, thank you. You know, Councilman Bogiano and uh, Councilman Kilmore really touched up on something that's very very serious here, and I, I really want you guys to hear us out here. We don't have a traffic division just don't have it. So, you know, my point in saying that is the same way you advocate here, make sure you send emails to the director of the police department and make sure you let them know to put the motorcycle squad back out, put more cops on, on you know, foot beats, you know, and your voice has to be heard. You know, we, we will do it, we will do it on our part the same way you guys came out here with that same, you know, with, with that same drive, you have to do that because like Councilman Gilmore said, you know, we're going to vote on an ordinance that's not going to be enforced because we do not have a traffic division. I don't want to, you know, damper, you know, the, you know, the, the atmosphere here, but I'm not going to lie to you either. You know, we have to make sure that that happens. We can help out here, but once again, you guys have to make sure that your voices are heard and make sure you tell the director we need a traffic unit. With that, I vote aye. Council President Waterman. 
Um, I want to thank the parents for coming out and expressing um, their concerns of what's happening in Heights. I, I want to thank uh, my director, um, Patel, because she's here, and her team. And I know since we put that team together, they've been out in the streets trying to make sure pedestrians are safe. So I really want to thank them because this is a serious issue. Um, um, for you who don't know, I got hit by a vehicle years ago and uh, my three-year-old son got hit and died. So uh, when you come out and say that you want pedestrian safety, believe me, I understand it and I'm fighting for it all the time. I meet with the director to see what else we can do. But just like um, Councilman um, Rivera and Councilman Gilmore said, it is an enforcement issue. We've been trying to get a traffic division um, ever since about four years ago, really. That's how long we've been trying to get a traffic division. Sometimes people don't understand the role of a council. Uh, our role is really to write legislation to get things passed, but then there's the uh, portion of the administrative piece that creates divisions for the city to function. And so just like you come to us, and I appreciate you coming because I do listen to public speaking and I welcome it. I wish you had that same energy to go to some of these departments and protest there. Um, to their directors so they can see that we're not the only ones, you know, that would like a traffic division. This is four years out. We've been trying to get one. All right. And like I said, um, we all up here, we, we get it. We really understand it. We're not fighting it. If anything, we're trying to improve it as much as we can with the power that we have. We are definitely trying to do that. So um, I proudly vote aye. Uh, don't give up fight for the traffic division because without enforcement, you cannot break people habits. You cannot, you cannot. So we do need enforcement. Okay, thank you. City ordinance 24-013 is adopted unanimously 9-0. Okay, hey, ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to be approaching our public speakers list. So if you can please pay attention to your agendas, okay. I'm going to be calling the number and the first name of the individual. All right. Excuse me, Sean. Sure. Can I just speak before of we go, before can. Councilman Rivera gets up? Um, I would just like to give a very brief update on the port side litigation and um, update on the recalculation. Um, I just want to make clear um, to everybody that it is at my and the outside councils urging that the council not engage with tenants or landlords or anybody related to the litigation as the litigation is ongoing. That is at my request. Um, so I wanted to make that clear in terms of the updates about the calculations. Um, just a few dates on February 7th of this year, the Bureau received document attachments from attorney Neil Murata after uh, he realized that his December 22nd, 2023 communication did not have any documents attached. They were sent to the Bureau on February 7th. On March 14th of this year, um, just last week, the Bureau has received documents from uh, the landlord via our outside counsel. These documents total approximately 40,000 pages. Uh, they are under review as well as the documents that were submitted um, by the tenants as well. And they're using these documents to determine the 527 individual rents. They need to be um, determined individually. There's no other shortcut. Um, the BA to his end has committed additional personnel to get mm -hmm. this calculated as quickly as possible. People with audit backgrounds, people that can assist in the calculations, they're gonna be working with the director to get this done um, as soon as possible. And then lastly, um, on March 7th, the Bureau was provided for the first time with a document from a tenant um, from the Towers, which contained an email from the landlord speaking about uh, limiting rent increases to those permissible under the rent control ordinance. Um, and on March 19th, our Office of Landlord Tenant responded and sent a letter to the landlord instructing them because the board's determination requires the Bureau to recalculate the rents for the building. There was no legal base rent established for increases at that time. 
They reminded them that they would be subject to viol um, to issuance of summonses and fines should they violate sections of uh, Chapter 260. Uh, there was also a letter issued to the landlord requesting their delinquent 2024 rent rolls and that they be provided by March 30th or that a summons would issue for that violation. Again, there are still two lawsuits pending. The city is a defendant in both lawsuits. I did provide the council with an update, a confidential memo. If you have any questions about legal analysis or the litigation, we'll have to speak um, about that offline so that I don't get in trouble either. But just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, Brittany, I don't believe this is in the, the litigation piece, but if you I'll just say it and if you don't respond, I totally understand where you're coming from. Just just on the the importance of getting the calculations of the base rent per the rent leveling decision um, and really trying to get get a timeline that we can communicate. Um, you know, the ruling was obviously in the fall. Uh, we're now into the spring. I know there were some we had to wait for the documents and all that things, but but you know, you said that more resources were coming, um, but uh, you know, I think from a council perspective and, and communication perspective, we really need to, you know, prioritize that. If we need resources, you know, council can authorize um, and just really prioritize getting those calculations done. We know there's 527, but, you know, that that is uh, of the utmost importance. BA, go ahead. Thank you, Councilman. So, uh, sorry, my voice was a little sick. Um, yeah, Councilman, so we, we have um, allocated four additional members from our internal audit team to go over it. And it's important we pick them because they do have accounting and, and, and uh, uh, finance backgrounds. And um, if we have to, we would engage additional outside accounting firms to try to get it done. What we're doing over the next two days is having the team work on a, a set that we've recently received to better understand what the expectation is week, uh, daily. And we could build that out over the 500 some odd uh, um, numbers. So we'll know within the next two business days how many we could do daily, and then we'll multiply that out till we get to the 500. Send us an email. Okay. Brittany, um, I do have a question too, if you can answer for me. So if if the the um document, how, what, at what point does it freeze? That like, so where they where are they not? How does that work? At what point? So is it from the leases from last year? That would be something we have to discuss offline. Okay, Sean. Ready? Let me just straighten out the camera. All right, like I said, I'm going to be calling the number and the first name of the individual. So with that being said, first speaker, 5.1, Laverne. I think she left. Okay. I think it was probably that long explanation you asked me to do. Um, next one is 5.2, Gina. Gina's here. Good evening. Justice for Drew. Gina Davison, Ward F. As always, I want to thank you all for your time, attention, and advocacy. I'm speaking tonight in support of item 3.4, Ordinance 24-017. Ranked choice voting just makes sense, and this ordinance seems like the first step in making it possible in our city, if the state allows. For those of us who care about representation and voters' rights, we support this kind of progress. I ask you not to underestimate your constituents. The main opposition we have been hearing is concerns that voters will get too confused by this con concept. Ranking candidates in order of your first, second, third choices and so on instead of being limited to picking just one is straightforward enough that with a little education and public discourse, we should be able to trust our voters to understand. Suggesting that we would not be able to understand and conceptualize this is frankly a bit patronizing. If the state legalizes ranked choice voting, we should not have a problem providing adequate education. We have many social media, digital avenues, print, and other resources that we can share in, a, in an accessible manner to educate our constituents. Mayor Fulop has lauded our city as a progressive, innovative place. And so instituting ranked choice voting would be yet another way for Jersey City to set an example to other municipalities and in our country. 
Because of this, I urge you all to support Ordinance 24.017 and give voters a chance to decide on ranked choice voting if the state allows. Power to the people. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.3, Tina. Hey guys, justice for Drew. I want to talk about the nonprofits. I'm a nonprofit. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years. It's a shame that Pix11 News had to come from New York to do an article about me to let people know that I need funds to continue to help out Jersey City. You would think that would be my leaders or my mayor. They actually said they're going to reach out to my mayor to find out why I don't have a space and why I'm back in my living room to do that and in my truck. I told them to let me know because I'm still waiting for the mayor to respond back to me. I want to say thank you, uh, Ms. Waterman, for the award that I received last night. I had to leave early because I had a family that stays at the hotel and they go to the pantry, but the pantry don't give them hot food. They cannot cook the food inside of the microwave. That's the issue. We should know that because we be in a community, as we say. Also, the development. Y'all let all these developments come. I was actually at a meeting with Education of Gilmore um, about what the, dev the development on Boswick. I believe the developments that come here to Jersey City, they should give something back to the community. They should do some type of resource. They should do some type of help that we will be able to build to, to build up on our community, not keep making it look the same way. I've been in War F for almost about 15 years and it have not changed. They still stand on the corner. It still look a mess, but you would think that we would have some type of resource, but we celebrate in everything else, but not the community and the area where I live at. We definitely need help on our block. I'm still waiting to find out what's going on with the Martin place. We was able to build other stuff around there in my community, but no one's still telling me about the Martin place. Um, I just wanted to say Thank you for everybody that been helping me. Jerry Walker, Education at Gilmore, Chief Staff Africa, for taking out the time on your busy schedule, Chief Staff Africa, coming out on Fridays to show me how to continue to fix my paperwork so I can get money. You don't understand how many people said they was going to help me and have not helped me. I should not be funding Jersey City to make it a better place. You would think my leader's going to do it, but that's okay because 2025 is coming and we're going to show them what to do and how to run the community. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.4, Edward. I don't see Edward. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, 5.5, Philip. Before I get started, I would like the, um, the leaders on this side or the employees on this side to give their names. The lady spoke. I don't know what is her name and the business administrator. So they need to let the public know what the names are and we shouldn't have to jet to guess. I need to um, hear. Oh, I, I could give them to you. So the business administrator is John Metro. Well, I know the name. I'm just saying it wasn't said. I don't know her name. And I don't know who spoke. That's Brittany Murray. She's the acting corporation counsel. Oh, it is gone. Ready? I'm changing. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Council President, one of the members of the City Council, I'm just my, my name is Phil Carrington. I want to speak again on the issue of the business district uh, improvement. Um, last week I made, I spoke and I had some problems and somebody had to have a little bit more pro, um, power than and then Jim McGreevy, Jim McGreevy needs to go to the way. I mean, he's as ridiculous as hell. How in the world he, a, a person's dirty thing will come can run a city again? Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> I just said what I got to say. Anyway, but the, the complaint was made and the captain came out and what and did really walk the beat. Captain of the West District. I got to give credit where credit is due because if the, the captain have shot somebody black, I would be on the front line condemning him so i got to give credit where credit is due and black folks got to do the same thing when they are the police is wrong um being in the front lines 
condemning them. And when they're right, I ain't seen nobody supporting that. But um, again, and uh, what I'm basically saying is that he came out, he gave some some summons, and, some summons, and the problem really subsided a little. And then the next Wednesday, uh, he came out on the night on the seventh. The next Wednesday, you have a captain from somewhere else. His name was. Uh, Kramer and and then so what I'm basically saying is that assistant is needed and then we need to the the police need to continue to uh, to be on the beat now on the issue of the Jackson Hill Improvement District I, I'm saying I don't see the need for them none of them I, I don't really understand exactly what is their purpose for example they have been in existence for 13 years or whatever else. I run three businesses and four, four different locations on Martin Luther King. Don't you know my name? My None of my businesses is registered with them. And they did nothing for me. I run the Family Collective Daycare Center, Remarkable Marsai Youth Council, and uh, Cafe Construction, 453, 450. I was in the Bethune Center for 12 years, 127, and 153. None of them. So which means they have done nothing for me. That is taxation without representation. So for 13 years, they did nothing for me. There is no need for them. So I know the last, last week we had the uh, Central Avenue uh, Improvement District. I, I, I meant far field. My problem really is I don't see the need for them. Gilmore has a new thing uh, for the uh, all but war effort. I think that yes, whatever is something from war effort. And these are the things that needed uh, that needed that they should be doing and they're not doing. And so I, I, I make these complaints asking for them to come out to give some assistance to me. They do they don't do that. I don't see the need for them to just drive past the problems that I have. Of course, Tina had the same problem like a stunt dummy and pass it and does not address it. The problems need to be addressed by Thank Jackson Hill. Thank you, from district. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Our next speaker, 5.6, Anne-Marie. Good evening. Anne-Marie Nazaro, Our Lady of Sorrows Parish, Ward F, and Jersey City Together Public Health, Public Safety Committee. I want to celebrate Jersey City. I'm an alum of St. Peter's College, now university, and tomorrow SPU team will play in the March Madness series. Can we say they're going to win? What else? They did it two years ago. They've made it pretty far. We celebrate this achievement and even more importantly, the abiding work of St. Peter's giving students, and I was one of them, who are the first in their family to attend college, this valuable opportunity and teaching us to be a person for others. Jersey City is poised to celebrate again. Jersey City can implement the program to send crisis intervention teams in response to mental health or addiction crises. Jersey City can save lives and honor Andrew Washington, Andrew Jerome Washington, our Drew, with this program. To the business administrator and the council, we at Jersey City Get Together emphasize there are three sources of funding New Jersey can amplify our Jersey City budget dollars with. They are the Arrive Together, the Attorney General's Initiative, M Court, the Mental Health and Addiction Services Initiative for 988 Mobile Crisis Outreach Response Teams, and most recently, the opportunity for funding that can come from our New Jersey legislature enacted Seabrooks Washington Community Led Crisis Response Initiative. We understand from our Jersey City Together Public Health Public Safety Chair Bill Lillis that in the meetings with council members and in communications with you, a state funding channel is actually being considered and looked into. We request this evening that a viable, and we've said it before, that a viable program be announced or indeed be implemented, be in place by May 25th, 
2024, the fourth anniversary of George Floyd's tragic death. And the end of that month, May, will be nine months since we lost Drew Washington. This brutality against George Floyd catalyzed getting 911 programs. Thank Let's you, get one here, please. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.7, Crystal. She left, thank you. Next speaker, 5.8, Julie. She left as well, okay. Next speaker, 5.10, Charlene. Good evening, Council. I'm here to talk about the Historic Preservation Office. Um, Right now, you know the master plan, historic preservation master plan is undergoing revisions, but it echoes what's already in the master plan itself, which all of you voted for. Creation of more historic districts by outreach to neighborhoods. Identifying more historic resources. Identifying landmarks in the city. Um, finding more grants to help with these, these activities. But effectively, right now, we have a historic preservation office that's only one person. And when you have four historic districts in downtown Jersey City, one up on the hill, and another one that's coming online within the next year, one person cannot handle the amount of work that is required just in what goes before the Historic Preservation Commission, let alone all of these other identified activities that this office is supposed to do. Now, all of you should be pressing the administration for getting that budget to your desks so you can evaluate where additional funding is needed. This is one of the offices that is, is not just needed, it's critical, critical for this city to continue to preserve its past and effectively have enough staff to do that effectively. So I really encourage each of you, particularly those of you that oversee a historic district or historic landmarks or particularly buildings that should be on that list, well, you should be pressing the mayor and the administration to make sure that that office has more than just one person who's doing all these jobs. Right now, I know they're hiring somebody for April, but what if that person doesn't work out? What if that one person we have leaves out of frustration or burnout? Where does that leave us? You need to really look at what the salaries are and competitive salaries in the area. And if you don't make those salaries look good enough, well, you're just gonna have an office of none. And that's not gonna be very helpful to us in preserving our history and our important buildings that should be preserved and our neighborhoods that really want. Thank you, Charlene want your support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.10, Sherman. Council, thank you for the good work that you do and the great work that you did tonight. Thank you to city planning for updating the JC Historic Preservation Master Plan. As the president of McGinley Square Community Board, historic preservation remains at the heart of what we are about and very core, at the very core of our community group's earliest days of formation. Tonight, I'd like to reiterate Charlene Burke's request mm -hmm. that adequate funding be allocated towards our very lean historic preservation office. Jersey City's HP office needs to become a CLG, Certified Local Government 
ASAP to become eligible to apply for $50,000 in annual state grants. Right now, that opportunity is just wasted. They also need more staffing to be able to keep up with the applications for buildings already in an HD and also to be able to effectively survey and add new resources to our existing inventory. It's a lot of work. It's too much work for just one or sometimes two people. I have learned that our HPO would ideally have one staff member on board for each 500 historic buildings. Since we can't simply clone Maggie O'Neill, that would entail hiring four to five new people. When you do, please include qualified beige, caramel brown, and black candidates too. Please also consider hiring someone from JC Landmarks Conservancy's Board of Committed Knowledgeable Local Preservationists. New York City's HPO has 80 employees. Let's empower Jersey City's HPO. We can preserve and protect our city's valuable assets if we invest in and grow the HP office. Also, I wanted to ask specifically if some protection might be put in place for the building that's slated to become the Pompidou Museum in case anything happens there. And also uh, the last thing I would request is the notion of starting a re to require a notification letter and hold a public hearing when there is a demo application for buildings that are over 50 years old. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, could you? Okay, uh, next speaker 5.11, Chelsea, I believe she left. You spoke earlier. Um, 5.12, Manya, not here. 5.13, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kevin. Hi. I'm going to uh, swap out the first part of this um, to address what happened earlier um, just before. I wish Brittany Murray could be back in the room at this point. Um, first, I really appreciate that dialogue. I really appreciate hearing that update. That is actually very helpful. Um, I also agree with Brittany Murray. She could hear this if she were in here. Um, we actually don't want you to talk about pending litigation. We don't want Brittany Murray to talk about pending litigation. When we ask about ordinances, uh, we just want to hear about the ordinance and not about any particular case. Um, one thing that's a little concerning, and I think you'll get a flavor of that tonight, is they're talking about putting a small army of people to help do the recalculation. That part's okay, um, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that recalculation won't be done according to what the ordinance says. And if that happens, then all of that work is actually a really long waste of time. And there's no sense in wasting that time. It would really be great. And we're willing um, to get together and see if we can figure out what the ordinance says. Can we get a consensus? And then perhaps the recalculation can happen and be done once. And that would be good. Also, we're OK with less pending litigation. If we can line up as to what the ordinance means and we are in agreement, we will have a lot less pending litigation. We would actually like to join forces, be on the same side for ordinance enforcement against the bad actor landlord. It doesn't have to be a bad actor city as well. And we are more than open to that, even if it results in less litigation, that would be great. Okay, now we'll see how much I get in. The council, led by council people Gilmore, Soleil, and Waterman, have asked us to bring forward proof our landlord has been violating rent control since the 2022 and 2023 determinations. One thing that was also interesting about what Brittany Murray said, only just recently did a tenant bring forward evidence. Okay, that's one thing. That's true. There was an email that a tenant sent. Um, but we also have Oprah's, so we know that the landlord, sorry, that the city has been in possession of considerable proof uh, for at least 11 months. So we didn't know we had to bring more forward um, until we were asked specifically to do so. Tonight, you will see um, 
one after another evidence that the Bureau has already had for at least 11 months. We received a letter yesterday, finally received a letter with Sharon Richardson's name at the bottom of it. It was an amazing letter. Um, however, I don't think that he perhaps wrote it. Um, this is a letter that pushed the ordinance right out the window as if we would somehow wouldn't notice it. Um, I say the letter says these things because I don't think, again, like I said, that Richardson wrote it. The letter attempted to grant our landlord a free pass to increase rents for years. The landlord had no authority to increase rents. The letter also ignores other aspects of the chapter. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. You'll hear the rest of it from everyone else tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, 5.14, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me tonight. My name is Elizabeth Middelo. It's actually my first time here. Um, I should be at home with my kids. I haven't seen them yet today, probably won't, but I think it's incredibly important for me to be here to expose a blatant violation of our city's rent control laws. I'm here to present irrefutable evidence of illegal rent increases at 100 Warren Street, specifically unit 1113, which occurred after the binding determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19th, 2022. On September 2nd, 2022, a new tenant moved into 1113, days after the August 25th, 2022 determination that the building was subject to rent control. Shockingly, the rent for this unit was increased by 43.9%, 43.9% over the prior tenant's rate. The increase is not only far beyond the allowable limit, but it was implemented without any legal authority. To make matters worse, the new tenant was never informed of the prior tenant's rent, which is a clear violation of Ordinance 260-31. The proof of this egregious violation has been sitting in the hands of the Rent Leveling Bureau since April 2023, nearly a year ago, when Equity Residential themselves submitted the current rental rate. Yet, despite having the smoking gun, the Bureau has taken no action to rectify this injustice. The Council has been, a been made aware of these ongoing violations at every single meeting, and now we're asking you to please act. I'm going to quote this gentleman over here earlier where he says, we need to enforce the laws. Stop the BS. We want equity to please stop the BS. Enough is enough. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice. And I think it's clear that we will not rest until it is served. We've provided the proof and now it is time for you to please act. The time for excuses and delays is over. Please learn more about our cause and help by searching Portside Towers on GoFundMe. Follow us at Rent Control JC on X, formerly Twitter, and email us at rentcontroljc at gmail.com if you are press a Jersey City or Equity Residential whistleblower, or with any questions about rent control in Jersey City. Personally, I will speak for myself here. I have two young kids at home. Every single month when I rent that, write that rent check, I am essentially giving equity an interest-free loan. And I use the term loan because I know that I am on the right side of the law here, and eventually they're going to have to give me that money back. The injustice comes in is that that money could be going into my retirement. It could be gaining uh, in building in a 529 for my children, but instead I'm giving it over month after month to equity, whether it's $200,000 or $200 a month or $2,000 a month, it's just too much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.15, Abhidnav. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abhinav Manu, a first time speaker here. And thanks for all the support from the group. First time speaker because I have to take care of this young one, right? I'm coming here before tonight to expose yet another example of the blatant disregard for our city's rent control laws. I'll present a evidence of illegal rent increases in 100 Warren Street, Unit 1209. Just days before after August 25th, 2022 determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved in the unit 1209 on September 2nd, 22. Despite the clear ruling, <coughs> rent for this unit was increased by 4.7%, 
over the prior tenants rate exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without any proper authority. Furthermore, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenants rent violating ordinance 260. The rent leveling board has been in possession of the proof of this violation since April 23 when equity residential submitted the current rental rates. However, the bureau failed to take any action to address this injustice. The council has been informed of these ongoing violations at every meeting and it is time for you to step up and take action. The rent labeling boards in action in the face of overwhelming evidence of rent control violations is unacceptable. Director Richardson later dated March 19, 23 is a clear attempt to defy the rent control ordinance and give our landlord a free pass to increase rents without proper authorization. The Bureau's failure to request necessary documents such as 2016 leases to calculate rents and their delay in complying with rent leveling board's order from five months ago is a direction of duty. We demand that council investigates this matter and take immediate action to ensure that laws are enforced and tenants are protected. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have suffered long enough. I, we all have suffered long enough. We demand justice and we will not back down until it is delivered. The proof is in your hand and it is time for you to act. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.16, uh, Yan. Hey, Yan. Hello, everyone. My name is Ayn Kosh and I'm 11 years old. I'm a first time speaker here at these meetings. I live here in our beautiful city and I really love it. But I need to talk to you about something super important to me and my friends, rent control. So I've had this awesome group of friends for like forever, or at least it feels like forever to me. We've celebrated birthdays, played countless games, and had many sleepovers. But then something sad started happening. In 2022, five of my friends had to move away because their families couldn't afford our rents anymore. And then two more friends left in 2023. Just two months ago, my very best friend moved out of the city. It's been really hard because every time someone leaves, it's like a piece of my world goes away. I've been trying to make new friends, which is cool, but I'm always scared they'll have to move away too. After my mom passed away last March, something really amazing happened. Our neighbors and friends here became like a big family. They checked on us, brought us meals, and just made sure we were okay. It showed me how amazing our community is, and it's made me feel safer and less alone. I don't want anything else to change around here because this community support has been a light during the toughest time in my life. Last November, they told us our building is now under rent control, which sounded like great news. It meant my family and I wouldn't have to worry about moving or losing more friends. But then I heard that the people who own our building aren't following the rules of rent control and that has me worried again. I know you all have a super tough job figuring out all this rent stuff, but I wanted to ask if you could please make sure the rent control rules work like they're supposed to. For grown-ups, moving is just a big to-do list and a lot of stress. But for us kids, it's losing our OG friends, our schools, and feeling safe and happy. So, could you help make sure our community stays a place where kids don't have to say goodbye to their best friends all the time like I had to? Thank you for listening me, listening to me today. I really believe you can make things better for our, for us and our community. I just want to say this it's a lengthy speakers list, but I don't think we're going to get a better one than that one. Amazing job, by the way. That's not easy to do. Well spoken. Uh, 5.17, Anna. Understood. So Anna and Lucy are not here. So we're going to 5.19. members of the council 
Uh, I'm Renata Sestari, and I come before you to shed light on a flagrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 155 Washington Street, Unit 2213. The evidence I'll present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on November 6, 2023. I am the tenant living in this unit and I have resided in the building since 2020, I faced a rent increase of 13.7% on November 11, 2023, after the November 6 determination. This increase was not only implemented without proper legal authority, but also exceeded the allowable limit under Ordinance 260-3. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. No more crumbs. We're not as stupid. We see what's happening. The tenants of 155 Washington Street have had enough. We demand justice and will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands. Either equity complies with the law or pays fines. No more excuses, no more delays, no more privileged treatment to the big landlord. It is imperative that Director Richardson issues a corrected letter that aligns with the Rent Control Ordinance and the Rent Leveling Board's decision. The current letter's misalignment with these legal requirements has caused unnecessary confusion and distress among the tenants of Portside Towers, who have already suffered from the landlord's ongoing violations, as you could just see from our lovely child. By failing to acknowledge the landlord's non-compliance with rent roll filing requirements under 260-9E and the landlord identity disclosure provision per 263J, the latter gives the false impression that the landlord had the authority to increase rents. We demand that Director Richardson rectify this error and provide a clear statement affirming that the landlord has not been in compliance with the ordinance and therefore has no right to raise rents. The tenants deserve a director who upholds the law. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.20, Joel. Yeah, we actually proved we did it. Go ahead, Joel, when you're ready. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joel Rothfuss, and I stand before you to expose another clear violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, apartment 1807. The evidence I'll present that I presented to you it demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination of the landlord tenant office in September of 2020. My family and I have been residents in the apartments at Portside Towers since October of 2019, and we have resided in the West Tower apartment 807 since June 19th of 2021. We were forced to accept a rent increase of 4% on June 21st, 2023, nearly one year after the written determination that at least as of August 25th, 2022, the West Tower has been subject to rent control laws of Jersey City. As evidenced by the documents I provided to you, our landlord has violated multiple rent control ordinances in relation to Unit 1807 at 100 Warren Street. Remember, on, June, on January 29th, 2023, Council for Equity Residential, Derek Reed, claimed that equity never raised rents illegally since the determination of September 22nd and October, November 23. All proofs presented here tonight occurred after those critical dates. Referring back to Kevin's points about the letter that Derek Reed provided, or uh, I'm sorry, that uh, 
Iron Richardson uh, provided yesterday. Um, it pushed the ordinance right out of the window as if we wouldn't notice. I'm going to say the letter said this or that because I do not believe Director Richardson wrote it. The letter attempted to grant our landlord a free pass to increase rents for years. The landlord has had no authority to do so. The letter ignores Chapter 260-9E related to when a rent roll is deemed filed. It ignored Chapter 260-3J related to compliance with the landlord identity disclosure requirements, even though Dinah Hendon testified in court that this requirement is, well, required in order to increase rents at all. Finally, um, the reference to base rents and looking at 2016, as Kevin mentioned, will waste a lot of time if we don't go back and look at 260, what a base rent is. The base rent is the first allowable rent when the unit was first rented and any allowable increases under chapter 260. As we have shown and we have tried to show, we have no evidence that our landlord has ever complied with all prerequisites to increase rents from 1998. So the rents, the rollback versus base rent are different concepts. We must be looking at what the legal rent was in, nine, in 2016 for our rollback, but the date is, the data is established in 1998. Thank you, Jerry. Our next speaker, 5.21, Tara. Good evening, Council. I stand before you tonight to expose yet another egregious violation of Jersey City's rent control laws. I will present clear evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, <coughs> Unit 319, which occurred after the binding determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19th, 2022. On September 30th, 2022, just over a month after the August 25th, 2022 determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 319. Shockingly, the rent for this unit was increased by 28.4% over the prior tenant's rate, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without any proper authority. Furthermore, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 263. The Rent Leveling Bureau has been in possession of the proof of this violation since April 2023 when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. However, the Bureau has failed to take any action to address this injustice. The Council has been informed of these ongoing violations at every meeting and it is time for you to take to step up and take action. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have suffered long enough. We demand justice and we will not back down until it is delivered. The proof is in your hands and it is time for you to act. The time for excuses and delays is over. It is unacceptable that Mayor Fulop and the Rent Leveling Bureau have allowed our landlord to continue extracting illegal rents, even after the binding Rent Leveling Board determination. This blatant disregard for the law and the rights of tenants calls into question Mayor Fulop's commitment to affordable housing and his ability to effectively lead our city, let alone our state. We have made hundreds of speeches pleading for help and intervention, and now we demand that the council and mayor do everything in their power to end this illegal situation immediately. The tenants of 100 Warren Street will not be ignored, and we will hold our elected officials accountable for their inaction. The Rent Leveling Bureau's failure to request necessary documents, such as the 2016 leases to calculate rents, suggests that their omission is intended to delay the process and deny tenants the justice they deserve. It is unacceptable that five months after the hearing, the Bureau has not requested all the required documents as ordered by the Rent Leveling Board. We urge the Council to investigate this matter, approve res resolutions to enforce the law, and find the landlord for these blatant violations. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have made over 400 speeches asking for your help, and now we demand that you take decisive action to end this unlawful and unjust situation. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.22, David. Good evening, I'm Dr. David Mason, 
This is my second time speaking directly to the council. I'm here with my wife Antonina and our son and daughter, obviously. Council members, I come before you to shed light on a blatant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1712, my unit. The evidence I present clearly shows an illegal rent increase that took place well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19th, 2022. Despite the building being officially subject to rent control as of August 25th, 22, when we moved our family into unit 1712 four and a half months later on January 7th, 23, we entirely unwittingly faced a rent increase of 16.4% over the previous tenant's rate, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority. Furthermore, we were not informed of the prior tenant's rent, a direct violation of ordinance 260-3i. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 23, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take timely, substantive, or sufficient action to rectify this injustice. Despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations, it is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have had enough. We demand justice and will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands. And the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Please learn more about our cause and help by searching Portside Towers on GoFundMe. Follow us on at RentControlJC on X, formerly Twitter, and email us at RentControlJC at gmail.com. If you are press, a Jersey City or Equity Residential whistleblower, or with any questions about rent control in Jersey City, what would you do? Follow the mandated recalculation to what legal 2016 rates should have been and equity knowingly stole at minimum $15,000 from my family. They still continue to steal at minimum $1,000 a month, claiming in writing that they're waiting for the courts despite the binding board ruling with no stay. Honestly, if you had two kids and a partner struggling to find employment in the current market, what would you do? Wouldn't you be down here demanding action with us? We heard a lot of talk about law enforcement a moment ago. I'm not even talking, I'm not even the tip of the iceberg here. These folks behind me constitute a fraction of the hundreds who are owed more than hundreds of millions of dollars. Wouldn't you be standing down here too? We've got plenty of room down here. Come on, grab a sign. We got plenty. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.23, Haruki. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Haruki Ikeda, and this is my second time speaking at this meeting. I stand before you tonight to expose a blatant violation of Jersey City's rent control road laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 308. The evidence I present clearly shows an illegal rent increase that took place well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19th, 2022. Despite the building being officially subject to rent control as of August 25th, 2022, a new tenant moving into Unit 308 on February 25th, 2023, six months after that decision, faced a rent increase of 16.8% over the previous tenant's slate, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority. Furthermore, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's right, rent, which is a direct violation of Ordinance 260-3i. If anything, this new tenant was actually deceived by the landlord who presented inaccurate information as part of the lease. The amount stated in their lease, the, the new tenant's lease as the land of the prior, the rent of the prior tenant was actually higher than what the previous tenant had paid based on the information equity and residential provided to the city. Equity residential submitted the 
current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, 2023 providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take any action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have had enough. We demand justice, but will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands, and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.24, Tasha. Good evening, members of City Council. My name is Tasha Saiti, and I come before you to shed light on a flagrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1815. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on November 6 this past year. The tenant in Unit 1815, who has resided since May 17, 2019, faced a rent increase of 3.5% on August 24, 2023. This was despite the Rent Leveling Board's determination on November 6 this past year. This increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no legal rights to raise the rent. Further, as Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau on April 2023, along with the new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet, the Bureau has failed to take any action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have had enough. We demand justice and we will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands, as we have said over and over again tonight, and it is time for action and that time is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Further, you have the authority to act under the Council's broad statutory authority under the Municipal Charter Law, the Faulkner Act, which grants the City full power to act for the preservation and promotion of the public health, safety, and welfare and to enact ordinances and resolutions for the protection of persons and property. This authority empowers the Council to take decisive action against landlords who violate the law and exploit their tenants. We urge the Council to use this authority and to continue to use this authority to its fullest extent to defend the rights of portside residents and to ensure that Equity Residential is held accountable for their egregious and ongoing violations. By adopting this resolution to enforce the Rent Control Ordinance and the Rent Leveling Board Determination, the Council sends a clear message on scrupulous landlords who seek to flaunt the law and exploit tenants will be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. This action reaffirms the Council's commitment to protecting the rights and well-being of all Jersey residents and demonstrates that the City will not tolerate predatory behavior from landlords. We call upon the Council to stand firm. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.25, Judith. Is Judith here? Okay. I see her. Good evening. My name is Judith Fury Rogers, and I am here to expose a blatant violation of Jersey City's run control law. I will present unquestionable evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, apartment 408. This occurrence, this occurred after the binding 
determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19th, 2022. On October 15th, 2022, just a month after the August 25th determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into unit 408. Astonishingly, the rent for this unit was increased by 19.6% over the prior tenant's rate, 19.6%, exceeding the allowable limit. This increase, 19.6%, was not only illegal, but also implemented without any prior authority, any proper authority, sorry. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 260-31. The proof of this is obvious. The proof of this obvious violation has been in the possession of the Rent Leveling Bureau since April 2023. April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. Despite having this clear evidence, the Bureau has taken no action to address this injustice. The council has been made aware of these ongoing violations at every meeting, every meeting, and it is time for you to take action. Enough is enough. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice and the tenants will not rest until it is served. Proof was provided, now it is up to you to act. The time for excuses and delay is over. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.26, Derek. Good evening, Council, back again. Uh, it's really nice that the word of the night seems to be enforcement, which is a great segue for my topic. It's going to be new for you guys tonight. It's, um, yeah, that's right, some more illegal rents and leases by our landlord. So if you could bear with us. Uh, I'm returning to speak tonight to present more evidence of yet another legal rent increase at 100 warrant units uh, 715. This particular occurrence happened after the binding determination by the Bureau of uh, Rent Level rent leveling on September 19th, 2022. On October 29th, 2022, two months after the August 25th determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into unit 715. Shockingly, the rent for this unit was increased by 18.5% over the prior tenant's rate, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without any proper authority. Worse yet, the tenant uh, was not informed of the prior tenant's rent violating ordinance 260-3L. Two violations and one illegal lease. Um, props to equity, they're pretty efficient in that regard. The rent leveling board uh, has been in possession of uh, the proof of this violation since April 2023 when equity residential submitted the current rental rates. However, the bureau has failed to act, take any uh, action of substance uh, for far too long. With that said, um, I, I want to point out the uh, quote from uh, Council Member uh, Gilmore from earlier tonight, which I thought was was awesome, um, and I hope I got this right. But he said, if, if we don't get serious about enforcement, this will all continue to be ceremonial. Don't think it can be said any better than that. Um, I'm looking at the face of you guys. We've been saying this a lot. You hear it a lot tonight. We all have better things to do. You guys have more pressing issues to take care of than a slam dunk thing that's been a problem for years and can be done if we just enforce the laws. So please look forward to helping uh, however we can to help you guys do your job. Let's work together, let's get this done. No more half measures, no baby steps. Let's push this across the finish line, get it done and move on. Thank you.
Our next speaker, 5.27, Gabby. Welcome to the movement. Members of the Council, my name is Gabby Banwait. I come before you to shed light on a flagrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1607. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred upon the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on 6th of November 2023. The tenant in the unit who has resided in the building since 1st March 2017 faced a rent increase of 4% on March the 7th this year after the determination. This, is, this increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in August 20, sorry, April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of violation. Yet the Bureau has failed to take any action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. I'm actually going to turn your attention to the investor report for 2023 for Equity Residential. One of their clear goals says, let me read this out. The, the corporation of Equity Residential is committed to creating communities where people thrive. Let's see how they're doing this. Rising rents forcing families out of Jersey City due to rental increases. Elevators not working. Plumbing issues where for the last two months I've had black gunk in my basin and in the toilet bowl. Front entrances remain unmanned due to lack of resources. Management not responding to emails. I've been waiting 12 months for an email for someone to sort out my lost post. No response to that. As a corporation, equity is making profit year upon year. If I look at your seal, it says the Corporation of Jersey City. So let me ask you this question. Is this the type of corporation that stands back while its constituents are fleeced through illegal rent raises? Or do you make good on its goals to do good to those who elected you? Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.28, Nick. Good evening, Nick DePasquale. It's my first time speaking. Uh, here are two members of the City Council to shed light on a flagrant violation of the city's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, apartment 904. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on 11 6 -23. My wife and I have lived in this unit since May 24th, 2019. We faced a rent increase on June 6, 2023 of 4% after the 11 6 -23 determination. This increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent. Equity Residential submitted the current rent rates to the rent leveling board in April 2023, along with the new lease providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet the Bureau failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have had enough. We demand justice. We will not rest until it's served. Proof is in your hands and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Thank you. Next speaker, 5.29, Shannon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon McGee, and this is my first time speaking to this council. First, as a tenant of Portside Towers, I am here to expose another shocking violation of Jersey, Jersey City's rent control laws. I am bringing forward indisputable evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1111, which occurred after the binding determination issued by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19, 2022. 
On October 31st, 2022, over two months after the initial August 25th determination that 100 Warren Street was subject to the rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 1111. Astonishingly, the rent for this unit was increased by an egregious 35.2% over the prior tenant's rate. This increase is not only significantly above the allowable limit, but also implemented without any legal authority. Additionally, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rate, violating Ordinance 260, Section 3I. The proof of this blatant violation has been in the possession of the Rent Leveling Bureau since uh, April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. Despite having this clear evidence for nearly one year, the Bureau has taken no substantive action to address this injustice. The council has been made aware of these ongoing violations at every meeting, and it is time for you to take decisive action. Enough is enough. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice, and we will not rest until it is served. We have informed you of these violations. We have provided the proof, and now it is up to you to act. The time for excuses and delays is over. Anyone who is interested, can learn more about our cause by searching Portside Towers on GoFundMe, and please help if you are able. You can follow us on X at RentControlJC and email us at RentControlJC at gmail.com if you are press, a Jersey City or Equity Residential Whistleblower, or with any questions about rent control in Jersey City. Second, I am also here as a resident and registered voter of New Jersey. To Mayor Fulop, as a candidate for governor, it is your Faulkner Act responsibility to enforce the laws of Jersey City and to protect the rights of tenants. However, your unwillingness to act in the face of these flagrant violations ca calls into question your commitment to affordable housing and, frankly, your ability to be an effective leader of our state. The fact that you have allowed our landlord, a corporation, to continue extracting legal, illegal rents from us, your constituents, even after the binding rent leveling board determination, is a clear dereliction of your duties. The tenants of Portside Towers make up a significant number of Jersey City's voters, and we demand that you take immediate action to address these violations and to prove that you are not just a progressive in name only. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.30, Connor. Uh, good evening, Council, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in front of you. My name is Connor Butner. I last spoke before the Council in February 2023 to discuss safety at Portside, the vast resources at our landlord's disposal to fix said issues, and the erosion of trust in the systems and laws meant to protect us as tenants. I'm here tonight to expose yet another violation of Jersey City's rent control laws by our landlord. Uh, my neighbor just just brought up clear evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1411, which occurred after the bonding determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19th, 2022. On October, 20, uh, October 31st, 22, over two months after the determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 1411. The rent uh, in this unit was increased by 25.9% over the previous tenant's rate, obviously exceeding the allowable limit. Per usual, this was implemented without any property authority, and the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 2060-3I. Uh, rent Leveling Bureau, as you've heard, has been in possession of this evidence since April 2023 and has not acted. Um, the council has also been informed of these ongoing violations at every meeting, and we obviously appreciate your continued advocacy on uh, behalf of your constituents. So I mentioned safety, resources, and trust. Equity Residential's resources are being deployed not towards proper upkeep, but to shield them from their illegal acts that they, as they continue to break the law. I also asked in 2023 whether our trust in Jersey City's government was misplaced. Is it? The Rent Leveling Board's determination uh, happening this past fall, the Bureau has continually failed to act given despite the necessary documents needed to calculate rents as we're continuing to prove out equity on a daily basis continues to break the law in writing to the detriment of Jersey City's residents. The extent that there's any concern as equity residential senior management said in their quarterly uh, earnings call that they might withdraw from the market uh, if God forbid they're forced to follow the laws that they're actually breaking. 
Um, I would point to the fact that Tishman Spire is currently building 2,000 new apartments at 50 and 55 Hudson Street. This demonstrates that other large, sophisticated landlords are willing to step in and deploy capital to meet the needs for safe, affordable, and legal housing that's also in line with Jersey City's laws. We obviously appreciate your focus and effort, and if you can push the Bureau to do their job, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ah! Our next speaker, 5.31, Rhiannon. Good evening, Council Members. I'm Rhiannon McElwee. I'm speaking to you for the fourth time, and I stand before you tonight to expose yet another egregious violation of Jersey City's rent control laws. I will present clear evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, apartment 1014, which occurred after the binding determination of the Bureau of Rent Leveling on 919.22. On November 5th, 2022, over two months after the determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 1014. Shockingly, the rent, or maybe not shockingly at this point, was increased by 19% over the prior tenant's rate for exceeding the allowable limit, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without any proper authority. Furthermore, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 260. The Rent Leveling Bureau has been in possession of the proof of this violation since April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. However, the Bureau has failed to take any action to address this injustice. The Council has been informed of these ongoing violations at every meeting, and I do respectfully submit that it is time for you to step up and take action. The tenants of 100 Warren Street have suffered long enough. We do demand action and we won't back down until it has been delivered. The proof is in your hands and please, it is time to act. Personally, when I moved into Portside Towers in 2020, we were enticed with a 15 month lease. Realising later that July is a much more expensive time to renew, we asked the following year if we could sign another 15 month lease, which would have led to a less expensive October renewal. Guess what? It wasn't possible. At no point during the process were we told that we wouldn't be able to sign another 15 month lease. This is so indicative of equities practices with lack of clarity and transparency. We currently anxiously await our renewal for July. It ought to be dropping into our inboxes in May. My six year old daughter recently asked if we will have to move from the place that she has called home since she was two. I fear what is coming next, as this is what we experienced the last time we tried to negotiate when they gave us a 10% increase. That is your 12 month offer. And just so you know, a new resident would be paying at least $200 more with your apartment if it were available today, which puts you far below the market rate. Due to this, we're unable to offer any other discounts to your current offer. We are still offering you a very competitive rate that is much lower than the current value of your home, and we hope you will take time to consider renewing for another year! Exclamation point. The leasing offices are faceless entities who are at pains to remind us of how lucky we are. In reality, their practices are immoral, illegal, inconscionable. Please take action. Our next speaker, 5.32, Daniel. Good evening, City Council members. I wanted to shed light on a blatant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws, this one occurring at 100 Warren Street, Unit 603. The evidence presented to you demonstrates an illegal rent increase that took place well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19th, 2022. Now, despite the fact that the building was officially subject to rent control as of August 25th, 2022, a new tenant moving into Unit 603 on November 11th, 2022, was subject to a rent increase of 6.1% over the previous tenant's rate. This increase not only exceeded the allowable limit, but also was implemented without proper legal authority. The new tenant also was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, a direct violation of Ordinance 260-3I, Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April of 2023, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. 
And yet the Bureau has failed to take any action to rectify this injustice, despite the council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations at every meeting. And as of today, there are 15 units at Portside currently on the market. If a new tenant were to apply to any of these tenants, any of these units today, they would have to agree an initial to the following statement in order to live at Portside. We hereby notify you that the premises in the community are exempt from the provisions of any rent control ordinance instituted by Jersey City, Hoboken, or West New York, as the case may be, and said premises and community will be exempt from any rent, future rent control, rent stabilization, or rent leveling ordinance instituted by these municipalities for a period of 30 years following the completion of construction at the community. So if any of you council members decided today that you wanted to live at Portside today, you would have to agree an initial to this blatantly false statement that Portside is exempt from rent control. How are they getting away with this? And I received a renewal letter from Portside yesterday, March 19th, with a rent increase, which as you hopefully know by now, they aren't allowed to do because they aren't allowed to increase rent at all because they have no authority to increase rent until recalculations have been finalized. And they said, I needed to reply by March 14th, which I am unable to do because March 14th is in the past and I don't own a time machine and I don't know how to build one, at least not yet. Council members, we have provided you with an overwhelming amount of evidence that equity residential plays by their own rules and doesn't follow the law. It is up to you to act. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.33, Vet. Good evening. City Council, I'm Yvette Avenhall. I reside in uh, 100 Warren Street. I'm here to present uh, concerns um, about the uh, Unit 305 at 100 Warren Street. Uh, they had an illegal uh, rent increase uh, that was imposed and um, determined on 9-19-2022. And nearly three months after the building was officially subjected to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 305. Uh, this tenant was charged 15% higher than their previous tenant. And that is obviously a clear violation of the allowable limit. Um, moreover, this increase was implemented without proper legal authority as they were not uh, advised about the increase and in, in the legacy behind it. Um, I would just simply just line it up with the uh, uh, Rent Leveling Bureau has um, had evidence of this violation of their possession since April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. Yet, uh, despite the council being made aware of these ongoing violations, at every meeting, the Bureau has not taken action to address the injustice. Um, the tenants of 101 Street demand justice and will not rest uh, until it's served. So, time for action is now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.34, Mark. Members of the City Council, we meet again. I'm Mark Boyles. I come before you to shed light on a fragrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 155 Washington Street in Unit 2513. The evidence in front of you demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on November the 6th, 2023. 
Unit 2513, um, I've been at since February the 15th, 2021, faced a rent increase of almost 3% on March the 12th this year, after, long after the November 6th, 2023 determination. This increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, 11 months ago, along with the new lease providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It's time for, device, device, well, excuse me, it's time for decisive action to be taken. Divisive, maybe, but decisive, definitely. The tenants of 155 Washington Street have had enough. We demand justice and will not rest till it's served. The proof's in your hands right now, and the time for action is also right now. No more excuses, no more delays. The potential consequences of the City Council failing to act on the resolution to enforce the Rent Leveling Board's determination and the Rent Control Ordinance cannot be overstated. If the Council does not take action during this meeting on March the 20th, the tenants of 155 Washington Street will be left with no choice but to exercise their First Amendment rights to hold public officials accountable. This may include social media campaigns, press outreach, and a strong presence at the State of the City address. The Council must understand that inaction on this matter will not be tolerated and the tenants will use every available means to ensure that their voices are heard and their rights are protected. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.35, Sean. Good evening, Council members again. Um, I'm a tenant at 155 Washington Street, apartment 504. And I've been here before and explained my, I think it was a, a couple meetings ago that I explained my situation. And here's the proof of it that just, they're handing out to you. And after the October 19, 2023 hearing, Equity Residential refused to provide me with a legal lease that was within the parameters of being rent controlled. They only gave me 24 hours. It was a 10% um, lease that they offered me and they gave me 24 hours to sign it, which is in itself is illegal as well. Instead, they converted me to a month to month and imposed an outrageous 60% rent increase. This action is not only a clear violation of the rent control ordinance, but also a blatant disregard for the binding determination rendered by the rent leveling board. It is important to note that month to month tenants are protected under rent control and the 60% increase imposed on me is entirely illegal. Equity Residential continues to charge me this exorbitant rate, even though the binding determination renders it 100% illegal. This treatment is nothing short of a disgrace. The landlord's actions demonstrate a complete lack of respect for the law and a callous disregard for the well being of their tenants. This must stop immediately. The proof of this violation is clear and dis indisputable. Equity Residential's own rent ledger, which I have provided, shows the illegal 60% increase imposed on me after the October 19, 2023 hearing. We call upon the council to take immediate action to rectify this injustice and to hold Equity Residential accountable for their egregious and unlawful conduct. The time for excuses and delays is over and we demand justice for all the tenants of Portside Towers. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.36, Danilo. Good evening, Council. Today, I also will present evidence of a serious violation of Jersey City's rent control laws, 100 Warren Street, Unit 1504. My wife and I faced an illegal rent increase of 14.4% well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination from September 2022, far exceeding the allowable limit. This increase is not only illegal, but also without proper legal authority. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 23, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed. 
It is time for decisive action now. No more delays. Also, equity not only charges illegal rents, they are clearly not qualified to manage the building. Our lease randomly showed as month to month in the EQR portal, despite we were on our yearly normal lease. The end date of the period shown was before the start date. When they sent us the renewal notice, the date when we were supposed to respond to their offer was one week in the past. Equity clearly not, is not only able to perform um, uh, illegal um, rents, they clearly cannot perform date and look back calculations of any kind. And let's not forget why, uh, an important aspect why we are here. We fight for all renters. Equity and others filed lawsuits trying to remove rent control altogether, arguing they would lose control over their properties. I fought for free market economy in the streets of East Germany, but it simply doesn't work for human rights. Everyone need, needs a roof over their heads. Therefore, people cannot simply not buy or not rent when it's too expensive. This was confirmed in a very recent ruling to lower realtor fees. Here a quote from the New York Times. There's also broader significance. It's a case study. Sometimes businesses can amass enough economic power to squash competition. And that is exactly what happened here in Jersey City with the rental market. Even Mayor Fulop is under their control. President Biden in the State of the Union announced a crackdown on price fixing in rental market. Mayor Fulop's State of the City address is tomorrow. Will he announce to enforce renters' rights in German cities? We expect nothing less for 70% of his constituents. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.37, Sonia. Council members, I stand before you to shed light on a flagrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 711. The evidence is present, clear, I present, clearly shows an illegal rent increase that took place well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination in September 2022. A new tenant moving into Unit 711 on December 6, 2022, nearly three months um, after the building was officially subject to rent control was subjected to a rent increase of 24.8% over the previous tenants rates, far exceeding the allo allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, a direct violation of Ordinance 260-3i. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet, to this day, the Bureau has failed to take sufficient action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed on these ongoing violations. We have had enough. We demand justice, and we will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Talking about delays, where is your investigation about Mayor Fulop's censorship? Mrs. Waterman, you have promised us to do that 10 weeks ago. Where are the rollback calculations? The first illegal rent increases filings were done in May 2022. Where is your outrage? This is happening to your constituents. You ignored us for almost two years here in this chamber. And talking about excuses, I honestly think you have no excuses. You've been knowing about people being forced out of their homes, about them becoming homeless, about altered forms, about all these things the Faulkner Act demands you to investigate for one year. I ask each and every one of you, please ask yourselves, what have you done to stop this? Do that right now. I'll finish with a quote by a very smart man, Albert Einstein. The world is, dan is a dangerous place to live. 
not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't and do anything about it. People were forced out of their homes on an absolutely illegal and evil basis. People became homeless and displaced. They still are to this date by our greedy landlord. Our voices were silenced on this issue by Stephen Fulop and still are. It's our current state. And you, what did you do? Our state should and will be discussed tomorrow when the mayor talks about the state of the city. We are the city. Our next speaker, 5.38, Drew. Members of the City Council, my name is Drew Kochanowski, and I stand before you today to expose a clear violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 306. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19th, 2022. On December 6, 2022, almost three months after the building was officially subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 306. Astonishingly, this tenant faced a rent increase of 5.8% over the previous tenant's rate, exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, a direct violation of Ordinance 260-3I. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, providing, a clear, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice and will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands, and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. It is crucial to discuss the implications of the landlord submitting the same non-compliant document year after year. In 2022, Equity Residential simply sent in the same document they had submitted in 2021, completely unchanged. This blatant disregard for the rent control ordinance and the required annual updates demonstrates their lack of good faith and willingness to, to comply with the law. By submitting outdated and non-compliant documents, the landlord is attempting to evade accountability and continue their illegal practices. The council must not tolerate this behavior and must take action to ensure that the landlord submits accurate and compliant documents each year. The landlord's repeated failure to provide the required information in the rent roll of submissions renders these documents invalid. By omitting essential data and failing to use the official city forms, Equity Residential is not only violating the rent control ordinance, but also preventing the Rent Leveling Bureau from effectively monitoring and enforcing rent control regulations. This lack of transparency and compliance is unacceptable and must be addressed by the council immediately. The tenants of 100 Warren Street deserve a landlord who operates within the confines of the law and provides all necessary information to ensure fair and legal rent practices. I want to call out that a base rent determination is separate from a rollback. Base rent doesn't equal the 2016 level, which is also illegal. Thank you for your efforts in this matter, and I'll mention this once again. Let's make some good news together. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.39, Aaron. Good evening, council members. My name is Aaron Kent, and I'm here to expose a shocking violation of Jersey City's rent control laws. I will present indisputable evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, Unit 706, which occurred after the binding determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on September 19th, 2022. On September 30th, 2022, just over a month after the August 25th, 2022 determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 706. Astonishingly, the rent for this unit was increased by an egregious 50 percent over the prior tenant's rate. That's 50 percent five zero. 
This increase is not only significantly above the allowable limit, but also implemented without any legal authority. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent violating Ordinance 260. The proof of this flagrant violation has been in the possession of the Rent Leveling Bureau since April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the, cure, the current rental rates. Despite having this clear evidence, the Bureau has taken insufficient action to address this injustice. The Council has been made aware of these ongoing violations at every meeting and it's time for you to take decisive action. I am also here to bring to light a flagrant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1912. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal increase that occurred well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19th, 2022. On January 26, 2023, nearly five months after the building was officially subject to rent control, a new tenant moved into Unit 1912. This tenant faced a rent increase of 11.4% over the previous tenant's rate, exceeding the allowable amount. This this increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority again. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, a direct violation of Ordinance 260. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau, Bureau in April 2023, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet the Bureau has failed to take imminent action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. Again, repeatedly. It is time for decisive action to be taken. Enough is enough. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice, and we will not rest until it is served. We have provided the proof, and now it is up to you to act. The time for excuses and delays is over. Please learn more about our cause and help by searching Portside Towers on GoFundMe. Follow at Rent Control JC on both Instagram and X, formerly Twitter, and email us at rentcontroljc at gmail if you are a press, a Jersey City or Equity a residential whistleblower, or with any questions about rent control in Jersey City. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.40, Shannon. Uh, good evening. Very happy and grateful to be here tonight with my chosen family. This group has helped me through a divorce from an abuser, illnesses, and professional reorganization that left me without a job. I'm also so grateful to this council for the support and uh, for your continued help to enforce the Bureau's actions. Uh, Councilman Rivera, I see you and I appreciate you being on your feet for us. Um, I am also here, like so many of us, as we were charged with doing to provide you evidence um, to expose a clear violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 155 Washington Street, Unit 402. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on 11-6-2023. Despite the tenant in Unit 402 residing in the building since December 6, 2022, they faced a rent increase of 6% on December 12, 2023, after the 11 6 2023 determination. This increase was not only implemented without legal authority, but also exceeded the allowable limit under the Ordinance 260 3. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The tenants of 155 Washington Street demand justice, and we will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no delays. Mayor Phillips' failure to address these ongoing rent control violations and protect the tenants of Jersey City raises serious concerns about his priorities. It appears that the mayor is more focused on his gubernatorial ambitions than on the needs of the very constituents he was elected to serve. The tenants of 155 Washington Street, along with renters across the city and the state, are struggling to make ends meet in the face of illegal rent increases and lack of enforcement by the city. We demand that Mayor Phillip prioritize the well-being of Jersey City residents over his political aspirations and take immediate action to address these violations. Mayor Phillips' inability to effectively protect renters in his own city calls into question his ability to lead the state of New Jersey. Thank you.
Our next speaker, 5.41, Gracie. Okay. Next speaker, 5.42, Alyssa. Good evening, Council Woman, Mrs. Water, Mrs. Watermelon. Um, my name is Alyssa Lattice. The last time I spoke was the end of 2022, 15 months ago, when I was a resident at Portside. Due to the wild increases on rent we received, we chose for our financial security to move. When we moved out on April 2023, we were paying 81 percent more rent than when we had initially moved in. A lot of evidence you've heard today have started with a new tenant moved in. All, for all of those new tenants, there was an old one that was forced out due to the non-enforcement. I am one of them. As Mayor Phillip toots his horn on how much affordable housing he has provided over his term, it is a slap in my face every time I hear it, because I submitted for unconscionable rent raises to the Office of Landlord-Tenant Relations in May of 2022. He has chosen no action for affordable rent for me, for all of us standing in this room, and for thousands of Jersey City residents who are renters. The length of this process hurts thousands of Jersey City residents every single day. Last council meeting, you asked to prove for the a violation since the rent control determination has occurred. Here, a blatant example of a violation of Jersey City's rent control law at 155 Washington Street, Unit 508. The evidence I will present demonstrating an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on November 6, 2023. The tenant in the in Unit 508 who has resided in the building since December 10th, 2021 faced a rent increase of 4.3% on December 15th, 2023 after the November 6, 2023 determination. This increase was not only implemented without proper legal authority, but also exceeded the allowable limit under the Ordinance 206-3. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Re Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the borough has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. I Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.43, Jessica. Good evening, City Council. Um, you've heard a lot of evidence presented thus far, and believe it or not, we're not done. Um, and I would make a suggestion that perhaps we would consider freezing rents as of 2021 as these recalculations are performed. And I'll give you an example of why that might be very important. Um, I'm here to share the story of a disabled tenant residing at 155 Washington Street in the building owned by Equity Residential. His experience exposes the egregious and ongoing violations of rent control laws and tenants' rights by the landlord. On October 19, 2023, a date I think we're all familiar with now, the Jersey City Rent Leveling Board unanimously determined that Equity Residential was not entitled to the claimed exemption from rent control for this tenant's apartment and the entire Portside Towers uh, uh, set of buildings. The board's written determination served on all parties on November 6, 2023, conclusively established that his unit has been subject to the rent control provisions of Chapter 260 of the Jersey City Municipal Code for the duration of his tenancy. Despite this binding determination, equity has continued to pursue a baseless eviction action against him, seeking to collect rent and fees that have been deemed unlawful by the board. They have filed a verified complaint alleging that he owes over $5,000 in unpaid rent, which is directly contradicted by the board's findings and Equity's, Equity Residential's own rent ledger. 
the landlord's attorney certification and landlord certification filed by Griffin Alexander PC on March 14th, 2024, further claim that the tenant now owes $23,453, which appears to include the same illegal fees and charges disallowed by the board. These actions constitute frivolous litigation, outright harassment, and retaliation against this tenant for exercising his legal rights. Equity Residential's attorneys have also made material misrepresentations to the Jersey City Municipal Council and to the court regarding their client's compliance with the rent control ordinance and the board's determination. This tenant has endured a relentless campaign of intimidation and abuse from equity, all while struggling with the challenges of his disability. They have refused to provide him with a legal lease, instead converting him to a month to month and imposing an outrageous 60% increase. This is a clear violation of the rent control ordinance. I'm really here today again, over a year and a half after we first showed up here, to demand justice on behalf of this tenant and to call upon the city council to take immediate action to hold equity accountable for their unlawful conduct. The proof of their violations is clear and indisputable. We're only showing you 35 of them tonight. We could show you more. Please stand with us. Please give us your attention on this critical matter. And I trust you will do what is right and take swift action to protect tenants like him. Our next speaker, 5.44, Tom. Good evening, council members. My name is Tom Miller, and this is the second time I am speaking before the council. I stand before you to expose a clear violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1105, my unit. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the rent leveling board on November 6, 2023. As the tenant in unit 1105, who has resided in the building since October 20th, 2010, I faced a rent increase of three and a half percent on January 30th, 2024, after the, uh, after the 11 6 2023 determination. This increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent. Of course, this was on top of all the other much more significant and most likely illegal annual rent increases for my unit since I moved into the building. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. It is crucial to emphasize the landlord's failure to take the actions detailed by their lawyer, Derek Reed, who falsely communicated to the Council that the landlord would voluntarily follow the law and had not imposed any illegal increases, despite substantial evidence to the contrary. This blatant misrepresentation is a clear indication of the landlord's lack of good faith and willingness to deceive both the council as well as the public. We call upon the council to recognize these false statements for what they are, a deliberate attempt to mislead and avoid accountability for the landlord's ongoing violations of the law. The council must recognize the landlord's pattern of bad faith, tenant harassment, and utter disregard for the law as demonstrated by their ongoing egregious violations of the rent control ordinance and disregard for the rent leveling board's determination. Equity residential's actions make it clear that they have no intention of complying with the law or respecting the rights of their tenants. We urge the council to take decisive action to hold the landlord accountable for their unacceptable behavior and to send a clear message that such conduct will not be tolerated in Jersey City. The tenants of Portside Towers deserve to live in peace and security without fear of exploitation or retaliation from their landlord. The tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice and will not rest until it is served. The proof is in your hands and the time for action is now. As we've said many times tonight, no more excuses, no more delays. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.45, John. Hello again. 
Excuse me. Uh, I'm here to shed light on another flagrant violation of Jersey City's uh, rent control laws at 155 Washington Street, this time Unit 1811. The evidence I present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the Rent Leveling Board on November 6th, 2023. The tenant in Unit 1811, who has resided in the building since February 10th, 2023, faced a rent increase of 1% on February 20th, 2024, after the 6th of November determination. This increase was implement implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent, even by that 1%. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. Yet the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. Tenants of 154 Washington Street have had enough. We demand justice and will not rest until it's served. The proof is in your hands, as you know, and the time for action is now. No more excuses, no more delays. Whilst the city's letter to equity yesterday regarding freezing rents since the November ruling is a welcome step, we won't be hoodwinked. The, the Bureau continues to assist equity as much as it can to not enforce the levelling board's de determination in full. This is the same Bureau that was a last minute no-show at Council Member Gilmore's recent town hall. Anything to do with Kevin and Michelle being present? Shameful, but hardly surprising. We presented you with a resolution to consider on enforcing the rent control ordinances. Should this move forward, we look forward to your backing it in full. I feel I need to add though, how has it come to this? Asking local government to vote on whether to enforce its laws or not. As always, we welcome any assistance you can give us to have this situation put right. Uh, the next speaker is due to be my wife who might come crashing through these doors at any moment, but probably too late, but she sends her best to council member Saleh who asked for this documentation, so thank you. So shall I ask if she crashed through the doors? <laughs> She's not here yet. Say again. You can. Oh, oh my God. Not her, right? If, if, if that would have happened, I definitely would have played the lottery. All right. So, so 5.46 Mel is not here. 5.4. 47 Vasiliki. I may be mispronouncing that. If I am, please correct me. That's me. Uh, my name is Vasiliki Flenga. Yeah, I did all right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my first time that I'm speaking in front of the council. And as everybody else, I'm here to expose a blatant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws. I will present evidence of an illegal rent increase at 100 Warren Street, Unit 424, which occurred after the binding determination by the Bureau of Rent Leveling on 9-19-2022. On November 4, 2022, over two months after the 8 August 25, 2022 determination that the building was subject to rent control, a new tenant, me, moved into 424. Astonishingly, the rent for this unit was increased by 27.1%. I was thinking I was getting a great deal at this point. Well, that's what I was told anyway. <laughs> uh, significantly exceeding the allowable limit. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without any proper authority. Moreover, the new tenant was not informed of the prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 260. The proof of this violation has been in the possession of the Rent Leveling Bureau since April 2023, when Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates. Despite having this clear evidence, the Bureau has taken no action to address this injustice. The Council has been made aware of these ongoing violations at every meeting and it is time for you to take decisive action. Enough is enough, as everybody else said, the tenants of 100 Warren Street demand justice and we will not rest until it's served. We have provided the proof and now it is up to you to act. The time for excuses and delays is offered. 
on a personal note, I'm a college professor. I've been teaching at a state college in New Jersey for 25 years. I moved, I chose to move to Jersey City when I got the job. I know that when I retire, I'll have to move away from the state and away from Jersey City because despite the great benefits, the great salary, it's not going to be enough to live here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.48, Michelle. Tonight, we've provided irrefutable evidence of the ongoing violations perpetuated by our landlord. It is beyond infuriating and frankly, it's criminal that the Bureau has had in its position, possession all the same documentation and yet the burden once again was placed on portside tenants to prove themselves. For the past two weeks, we've essentially acted as surrogate Bureau staff, compiling evidence that should have already been acted upon by administrators who are compensated by taxpayer dollars to enforce the law. Hold them accountable, dock their pay, and investigate everyone who has their hands in the operations of that office. Now that you have the proofs, I'm looking forward to Director Richardson making good on his word to fine my landlord for its blatant violations as he noted he would, as he noted would happen in yesterday's letter sent to Derek Reed. Chapter 260, Section 17 leaves no room for interpretation. The director has no choice but to mandate punishment for all violations committed by equity. And you bet that after we did clean up for city administrators who haven't been doing their job, we will be following up to ensure fines are issued and paid. You should do the same follow up. Do it as part of your investigation into the evident backroom shady dealings of the bureau and city attorneys. There are obviously there are obvious deep issues at play from Dinah's bogus determinations to Jonah Knowles letters demonstrating a lack of basic math skills from the general deliberate obfuscation by Corporation Counsel to Brittany Murray refusing to answer a question of law having to do nothing about our pending litigation. And yesterday's letter, signed by Director Richardson and addressed to Derek Reed, was rife with more, more misinformation aimed again at stalling and favoring our landlord. No one in the Bureau has the authority to tell equity that, it, that what it submitted in place of legal rent rolls can serve as legal substitutes. Council members root out corruption, investigate who really penned yesterday's letter and fire them. Director Richardson, you are being used by the city's attorneys who are sullying your name and reputation. Portsiders are on the right side of the law. I believe everyone from the city council to corporation council to full up knows it. I urge you to reflect on your role of the injustice being inflicted upon all portsiders that is happening in your name. I pray that your moral reckoning happens very soon because in the end, Stephen Fulop will not be able to offer you protection. Just like he's no friend to us or the tenants of Jersey City, I believe that he's no friend to you. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.49, Suthina. Good evening, council members. My name is Suthina and I'm a first time speaker. I've come before you today to expose a blatant violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street, Unit 1706. The evidence I will present demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred well after the Bureau of Rent Leveling's binding determination on September 19, 2022. Despite the buildings being officially subject to rent control as of August 25, 2022, a new tenant moving into Unit 1706 on December 1, 2022 faced a rent increase of 7.7% over the previous tenant's rate, exceeding, that allowable, exceeding the allowable limit. That tenant was me. This increase was not only illegal, but also implemented without proper legal authority. Furthermore, the new tenant was not informed of their prior tenant's rent, violating Ordinance 26031. Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take action to rectify this injustice, 
despite the council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. A little background on me and what's brought me here. I had been a pediatric intensive care nurse at NYU for several years and worked in the epicenter of the COVID crisis. Putting my health and the health of my pregnancy on the line while working to care for the most critically ill in New York City. In August of 2022, just a few weeks before my son was born, we moved to Jersey City for respite, hoping to start a new life here. We were lured in by a reasonable rate when we and when we first started renting. Within one year, we were dumbfounded by the exorbitant increase and we were paying, we are paying well beyond that rate at this point. Our hard earned income is being is feeding the pockets of corrupt entities rather than towards our own families and well being. It is atrocious that we have all been taken advantage of in this way. It is important to discuss the landlord's failure to comply with the rent roll regulation requirements as outlined in ordinance 269 E. By not properly registering rent rolls, the landlord is not only violating the law, but also making it difficult for the rent leveling bureau to enforce rent control regulations effectively. This non-compliance is a clear attempt to evade accountability and continue exploiting tenants with illegal rent increases. The council must take action to ensure that this land, the landlord complies with these requirements and faces consequences for their deliberate non-compliance. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.50, Emily. What's this? Good. Good. Are you ready for my Mad Lib? Here we go. Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Wengert, and I too stand before you as a resident of Portside to expose yet another, is it going to be egregious or blatant? My word is clear, clear violation of Jersey City's rent control laws at 100 Warren Street. For this one, it's unit 1205. The evidence I'm presenting demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination by the rent leveling board decision on October 19th, 2023. At this point, you know these dates and numbers. The tenant in unit 1205, who has resided in the building since July 10th, 2017, faced a rent increase of 3.2% on October 31st, 2023, after the October 19th determination. This increase was implemented without proper legal authority, as the landlord should have had no ability to raise the rent when those rents were already determined to require recalculation going back six years from when the first petition was fired, filed. Equity Residential submitted the rental rates to the Rent Leveling Board in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this, there it is, egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take swift action to rectify this injustice, despite the Council being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. It is time for decisive action to be taken. The Portside Tenants Associations submitted a draft resolution this past Monday. It only is meant to ensure that the law is followed. You all have this resolution in your hands tonight. Please bring that resolution to a vote at the next council meeting. If anyone thought we Portsiders would go away, let today remind everyone that we will not. For countless council meetings in a row, Portsiders are here. If anyone thought maybe we were just overblowing what was happening, let today show you that we have not. We were asked to bring evidence to this room, and we have in droves. If anyone thought this was just a few noisy people over there in Portside, that Kevin, that Michelle, let today show you that it is not. We brought more people today than ever before, and there's hundreds more we speak for. If anyone thought that partial enforcement of the laws of the city would be enough, let today show you that we will not rest until full enforcement and complete justice is served. The proof is now in your hands. Please support our request to follow the ordinance completely, not partially, based off accurate base rent determinations. Thank you. No more delay. Thank you.
Our next speaker, 5.51, Mandy. Is Mandy here? She left, okay. Next speaker, 5.52, Elvis. Is Elvis here? He's left the building. <laughs> that was a good one, Sean. I can't take credit. <laughs> McKenney was uh, actually turning around and telling me that. Uh, 5.53, Greg. Is Greg here? I think he left too. Next, 5.54, Brendan. Thank you. Next speaker, 5.55, Huretta. It's Brendan Duhan. Thank you. Okay. Huretta, right? Word of Niels, a lifelong resident of Jersey City, St. Peter's Prep grad. And I'm here to talk about the certified living, certified artists that live in Jersey City and the particular ones that live at 150 Bay Street. Um, I'm addressing this to the mayor, city council, to the city zoning board, and Jersey City Housing. This letter represents the eight apartments that are controlled by the city zoning board and assigned to the quality qualified Jersey City artists in the Waldo District under the 2001 zoning law. The Jersey City Artist Certification Board has controlled and set the living wage rent for the certified living workspace as defined by the Jersey City Code 35, 3345-11 zoning law that remains as today. The zoning law was established to create live work opportunities for artists who reside in Jersey City, creating a revitalized downtown warehouse district. The landlord at 150 Bay Street has attempted and has succeeded to skirt this law by increasing the rent of the certified artist apartments without following the established procedure. The nature of the law has, in precedence, required that artists has a potential to qualify and submit a robust portfolio of work that in indicates an active career along with tax information to, not, to Jersey City Artist Certification Board. The Jersey City Artist Certification Board would then receive the portfolio and determine if the artist, including performing artists, would be assigned a certification number. If the artist qualified, the artist would enter a pool of artists available to qualify via lottery for a live work unit in a newly developed Waldo neighborhood. When a number of qualified artists are chosen via lottery, they would have to present their tax identification number, pay stubs, recent 1040 or similar tax forms for approval to Jersey City Artist Certification Board. Upon approval, the Jersey City Artist Certification Board would assign an existing certified work, live work apartment in the artist based upon income levels determined in the review. The procedure above has been the same since inception in 2001, and the certified artists are familiar with the procedure and understand the basis of this law as it is written and maintain their records to reflect any requests and pertaining artist portfolios, interview requests, and tax submissions. The landlord at 150 Bay Street was able to renovate the existing warehouse and achieve an additional floor of residential construction, along with extensive outdoor space adjacent to the additional floor and terraces and so on. The improvements of the building and renovation followed the 411-2001 Jersey City Land Development Ordinance Zoning Law and the Jersey City Artists Council uh, oversaw the regulation, use, and distribution of the eight total Jersey City certified apartments in this location. I want to conclude by saying um, we collectively signed this letter to request a formal meeting between all parties. This meeting should resolve the conflicts of interest between the various agencies assigned to the task of completing what a Jersey City Artist Certification Board was created to maintain. Thank you. I can just say, Mr. Hills, we'll, we'll uh, reach out to set up the meeting. Our next speaker, 5.56, Elizabeth. Hello, council members. I'm a resident at 150 Bay Street, and everything he just read to you is something I was going to also say, so I don't have to read it again. We just need help. We need to have a meeting between who's in charge now of the artist certification. They're requesting tax returns, different things that are very important. Obviously, we want to make sure it goes to the right parties. So if you guys could just help us get a letter 
from whoever's in charge of the Jersey City artist certification now and give it to us and then we'll comply like we do every year, giving our tax returns and just have the program keep going along as usual. Right now we're being a little strong armed into giving, um, some people would talk to us, we don't really know and they want our tax returns and say you have three days to give it to us. It feels like we're being strong armed and um, we really are just artists. We we don't, we've always complied with the Jersey City Board by letters. They would send us a letter telling us what is needed and then we'd give our tax return and everything they would need and we'd perform and everything we do every year to prove we're artists bringing art to Jersey City. We love it here. We don't want it to change. We just want some help clarifying who's in charge. Where do we send this material? So we know it's in good hands. So again, I'm Eliza Niels. I'm at 150 Bay. That was Warden Niels, my husband. We represent a lot of the artists in the building. They're not here tonight, but we're speaking for them all pretty much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.57, Mo Mariah. Good evening. Um, so I'm here um, representing the nitty gritty Jersey City Social Club. Um, I'm on the organizing committee. We started out as a group of women in 2017 to keep resisting and persisting. And we've grown as a group to work on pro-democracy initiatives to engage uh, people in voting and not for the status quo of democracy, but to expand democracy to create a more inclusive democracy. Um, so. Um, our group, the Nitty Gritty, um, is in support of the rank choice voting trigger ordinance. And so we're asking the city council to um, pass that ordinance at the, you know, the next city council meeting. Uh, rank choice voting is a way to increase voter turnout and the diversity of candidates. Um, it, re it also reduces the expense of runoff elections because you don't have them and it acts as a runoff election when you have the ranked choice voting. Um, it's also very important right now because there is state legislation for Jersey City to show support for ranked choice voting so that we could have state legislation passed um, and then Jersey City could be one of the first cities to enact ranked choice voting here. Um, it has been acted in other cities and other states like Maine and Alaska. It's very simple. Uh, we participated in a Rank the Beers uh, event recently. Um, again, it was just a very simple way to do it. It shows that your vote counts no matter if it's your first or second or third choice. Um, and so, yep, yeah, just want you to take it into consideration and hopefully that you will pass it at the next city council meeting so that we can have ranked choice voting in Jersey City. It's a needed reform to expand our democracy and to get, engage more people and to get more candidates running for office. Um, as somebody who has run for office and knowing how toxic that can be when it's a zero sum game, ranked choice voting is a way to change that. Um, because you want to be someone's second choice. You want to be their third choice. Um, so you're not trying to tear people down in that way. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Our next speaker, 5.58, Brendan. So this was the Brendan we were looking for, but he's not here. Okay. Can't do that. Next, 5.59, David. Just when you thought it was safe. Uh, we're back. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is David Wilson. Uh, this is Mary Solomon. Um, I've been a, I've been a Jersey City resident since 2005. She's been a Jersey City resident since 2002. Uh, this is my first time speaking for the council. Um, I stand here tonight to expose a clear violation of Jersey City's wind control laws at 155 Washington Street, Unit 708. The evidence that we just presented demonstrates an illegal rent increase that occurred after the binding determination of the rent leveling board on November 6, uh, 2023. The tenant in Unit 708, who's resided in the building since January 16, 2021, faced a rent increase of 2.3% on February 6, 2024, after the November 6, 2023 determination. This, re this increase was implemented without proper legal authority as the landlord had no right to raise the rent. 
Equity Residential submitted the current rental rates to the Rent Leveling Bureau in April 2023, along with a new lease, providing clear evidence of this egregious violation. However, the Bureau has failed to take meaningful action to rectify this injustice, despite being repeatedly informed of these ongoing violations. I'm also a tenant on 155 Washington Street in Unit 301, and right now, Equity is offering us a renewal lease with an illegal rent increase of 3.1%, and also uh, an, a rent control addendum that falsely states that our unit is not subject to rent control and it's not severable from the actual lease, which is also illegal. Anyway, they reiterated this tonight, this very night after receiving the letter uh, yesterday of March 19th. Um, I was also a tenant at Portside uh, from 2005 to 2007 and I had to leave then because of outrageous rent increases, but I'm not gonna get into that here because I'm not bitter about that. So I do need your help to make the Rent Leveling Bureau file the ordinance, um, but I'm not asking this just for me. There are a lot of people in this city who are in units, they're subject to rent control, and they may not be here tonight. And uh, they may, many people I think don't know that they're in rent control units because maybe like, like me, they believed uh, what the landlord put in the lease that it wasn't subject to rent control, but it was. So um, it's very important for you to, to press the Bureau to take action on this. And I have 10 seconds. So please learn more about our cause, search Portside Towers on GoFundMe, follow Rent Control JC. Um, if you're on the former Twitter and then get off Twitter and um, email us at rentcontroljc at gmail.com. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.60, Veronica. I like how just the first name does it. <laughs> Good evening, Council. My name is Veronica Akezua. I'm a Jersey City resident and I'm a member of Voter Choice New Jersey. I'm here tonight to urge the Council to vote in favor of passing the proposed Ranked Choice Voting Trigger Ordinance at the next City Council meeting. This ordinance would put a ballot question to Jersey City voters to decide whether they want to use Ranked Choice Voting in local elections. The ballot question would be triggered when the state passes the Municipal and School Board Voting Options Act, and that act permits municipalities to adopt ranked choice voting. It's taken one and a half years for advocates working with council members Gilmore and Solomon to get this ordinance onto the city agenda. And so at this time, we can't wait any longer to get this passed. We are en route to getting support for our ranked choice voting state enabling bills from the complete state legislative delegates that represent Hudson County. That's state senators and assembly members in legislative districts 32 and 31. In fact, uh, Assemblyman John Allen is the primary sponsor of our state enabling bill in the assembly. Okay, so there is momentum for this. Uh, Within Hudson County, Hoboken passed a trigger ordinance, and with Jersey City passing this ordinance as well, both municipalities are poised to implement this if the voters decide to adopt it. Simply just let the voters decide. There have been concerns raised by the council around voter confusion, uh, respectively. I. I respectfully, I think we've demonstrated that we really are committed to voter education in Jersey City. Uh, we have already hosted six uh, mock election uh, events in several wards. We have worked with colleges and universities as well to educate the youth population. I didn't mention that two of our uh, rank it events were tailored to the seniors uh, in our communities. If this is passed, we are going to continue to educate the public uh, because they stand to benefit. In a time when the country's uh, 
When American democracy is really under attack and in a time when the state's undemocratic practices are coming to light, I'm talking about gutting Oprah and the negative effects that uh, the party line has on candidates and voters, it's time for elected officials to stand up for a pro-democratic reform. I say, let the voters decide. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.61, Linda. Hello, I'm Linda Velwest. I am in Ward F. Um, I am here to speak up about ranked choice voting and to encourage everyone to vote for it when it comes up. Um, it helps our democracy. It encourages more people to run, more people to vote. Um, it is automatically a uh, um, a runoff, so you don't have to spare the time and expense for having runoffs. It encourages um, polite uh, elections so that people don't have to fight. They want to encourage uh, people to vote for them. Um, so if they, maybe they're not the first choice, but they want to be the second choice, so they don't want to tear anyone else down who's running. Um, Next Wednesday from 12 to 1 at St. Peter's University, we're going to be having a ranked choice voting event where there'll be a presentation explaining it. Uh, someone will talk about their personal experience in ranked choice voting in Jersey City and lunch will be served and um, the dessert will be four different types of cookies where people will then rank choice vote their favorite cookies so you'll have an experience of ranked choice voting, um, which is the favorite cookie. Um, so I would encourage everyone to come. That's next Wednesday at McIntyre Hall at St. Peter's University. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.62, Barry. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Barry Bender. And I don't live in Jersey City. I come from Ocean County, a town called Forked River. Uh, but I consider, and I've said to many people, Jersey City is my ancestral homeland because this is where my family settled when they came from Europe. So this is like home to me also. Anyway, I'm the uh, live outreach lead for Voter Choice New Jersey. I've been here in, New in uh, Jersey City numerous times, various parks various events where we're ranking whatever. Um, and I've found the people of Jersey City to be very open and understanding of what ranked choice voting is about. My introduction to ranked choice voting uh, came, I'm, I'm a member of the Green Party. And in 2017, uh, when I first joined, somehow I got grabbed to uh, participate in the elections of the leadership of the party, which has been done with ranked choice voting forever and ever. Um, I had never heard of ranked choice voting before, and they brought me out and said, you're going to be the one doing the counting. Um, I made no mistakes, and I found it very easy to understand and to say that people would have a problem understanding ranked choice voting. You can look at the percentage of the polls that were taken in New York City after their primary. To me, ranked choice voting is um, a large step to increasing democracy for voters of this, of this country. Um, it, as mentioned before, decreases the hostility between candidates because if I'm going to be saying bad things about someone, obviously their voters aren't going to pick me as their number two choice. And ranked choice voting will calm things down. Um, there'll be more civility and another guarantee of ranked choice voting. Okay, and this is a big, this is my biggest one is that you're guaranteed that the winner of the election has approval by more than 50% of the voters, meaning a majority. And I can give you an example. I can give you an example this past year in this past election. The mayor of Kearney was elected with a 37% plurality, which means 63% of the people wanted someone else to be their mayor. Ranked choice voting guarantees that the winner of your election 
will have the majority of the people supporting them. And I think that's a critical thing. And I thank you for your time tonight. All right, we have our next speaker up. Hi, my name is Jack, and I'm a new resident of Jersey City, which is great. And this is the first time I've ever spoken to a city council. Wait a minute, Jack? J Jack Cunningham. It could be John Cunningham. Not yet. Oh, I have a couple other speakers before you. I'm sorry. Are they here? <laughs> 5.63 Athos? No. Not here. 5.64 Adrian? Okay. All right, Jack. I'm sorry. Wow. Well, well, I said it was a rookie. Right? Like, I was name. clear about that from the beginning. <laughs> Alrighty. So, uh, my name is Jack Cunningham. I'm a new resident of Jersey City, and I'm a volunteer for Voter Choice New Jersey. And uh, I want to talk to you about why I want I support this ranked choice voting trigger ordinance. When New York City was given the opportunity to vote uh, in favor of ranked choice voting, they did so with 70% of the vote. 70% of voters supported ranked choice voting. And what preceded that was the most competitive election that New York City has seen in generations. And as a result, it had the highest turnout in 30 years. Ranked choice voting is incredibly effective. In its most recent poll, 77% of New Yorkers currently support ranked choice voting. And to be clear, this is not just a New York City thing. In the past three years, ranked choice voting has won every single time it's been put on the ballot. And that includes liberal cities all the way to small Republican towns in Utah. Voters are desperate, desperate for more choices and more change. We're asking Jersey City to commit to ask the same question to Jersey City voters uh, if Trent lets them. Do Jersey City voters want to end spoilers? Do they want to replace low turnout runoffs and have more choices on their ballot? We deserve to find out. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.66, we. Hello, uh, my name is Wei Zhang, and I'm a new resident of Jersey City. This is my first time speaking at a city's council meeting, and I'm here to show my support for the ranked choice voting uh, trigger ordinance. Uh, I have attended several events held by the Voter Choice New Jersey group and had the chance to learn about what ranked choice voting is and participated in the mock elections using this different way of voting. I think a lot of the attendees, myself included, uh, were able to quickly pick up on how ranked choice voting works since at the end of the day, we are just ranking our first, second, third, and so on choices on the ballot. If people are uh, only have one candidate that they like, they can still choose to just vote for one that that one candidate. Uh, but for people who have multiple candidates that they like on the ballot, then they can list out all their preferences and really have their voices heard. I think this is a simple change that makes voting better, and I urge members of the city council to vote in favor of passing a ranked choice voting trigger ordinance for Jersey City. Thank you. Next speaker, 5.67, Renee. Good evening. Um, my name is Renee Steinhagen. I too am a relatively new resident of Jersey City, but I'm a member, um, the executive director of New Jersey Appleseed and one of the lead of Voter Choice New Jersey. I urge you to vote yes on ordinance 24017 that we would enable, we're enabling voters of Jersey City to adopt a ranked choice voting pursuant to a referendum that would appear at the next general election ballot following the passage of a state law that would enable any municipality, regardless of form, to employ ranked choice voting for their municipal and state uh, school board elections. I'm not going to discuss benefits. Uh, other people have spoken about that today, but I'd like to focus on the validity of this ordinance, why a trigger ordinance, 
and the role of this council as representatives of the second largest city in New Jersey, what you can play in what is really a grassroots campaign of voter choice New Jersey to secure ranked choice voting for all voters in the state. Uh, first, this ordinance is not premature. One doesn't have to wait for the state enabling legislation to pass for you to put in an ordinance, a directive that the legislation um, to be adopted can be uh, on the ballot. This is a process that's consistent with uh, change in government questions, charter changes, which under the Faulkner Act must always go to the voters. Second, others have talked about that we understand that you believe that the trigger ordinance or RCV are confusing, but neither is. And as we have talked, we have been doing events and people not only understand ranked choice voting, but they enjoy using it. Secondly, we explain the trigger ordinance and why it's necessary to do a trigger ordinance because the state current law and state only allows uh, the candidate who gets the most votes to win. So now it's time for Jersey City with its neighbor Hoboken to lead the way really to let our state legislature know that the voters of this state want to have the choice as to whether to use RCV in our local elections. This is going to be a, cherry, a change emerging from the voters themselves and not one imposed on us by our legislature. Thank you. Our next speaker, 5.68, Warren. Warren's not here. Next speaker, 5.69, Alexa. I think she left. Next speaker, 5.70, Harris. Not here. Next speaker, 5.71, Cynthia. Not here. Next speaker, 5.72, Richard. Not here. And last but not least, 5.73, Jeff. Good evening. Um, my name is Jeff Goodwin, a Jersey City resident. And uh, I've been a professor of political sociology at uh, New York University for the past uh, 33 years. During that time, I've had the opportunity to study electoral systems and party systems across the globe. So I'm just here to say that uh, what you've been told by previous speakers is indeed borne out by the social science, largely political science literature <clears throat> on what we call the single transferred vote system. As what is that? STV. Ranked choice voting is just another name for this well-known uh, form of voting. And as previous speakers have mentioned, uh, it does increase the choices available to voters. It does increase, all things considered, voter turnout. And it's just common sense that people, when they have more choices than two, or more likely these days, just one name on the ballot, that they're going to be more motivated, more likely to go to the polls to vote. And I don't think it's been mentioned yet uh, that among many of the benefits of this system is the elimination of the so-called spoiler effect. That is, a lot of people would like to vote for a third or fourth or fifth party if they had the opportunity, but given the electoral rules of our own single non-transferable vote system, really once two parties have become institutionalized, it's very difficult for a third party, never mind a fourth or fifth, to find its way to electoral strength. And the reason is quite obvious. <laughs> Voters fear that if they vote for a third party, they're going to take votes away from a party that they might otherwise vote for and make it possible for an absolutely horrible party that they would never vote for to win. So 
Uh, this has been the bane of third parties in the United States, this fear of actually empowering the worst sorts of people, the worst politicians. So um, the single transferable vote system, rank choice voting, eliminates this so-called spoiler effect. Just one of the many reasons why it enhances voter turnout across the globe, Ireland, Australia, Canada, many cities and states across the US. Came Thank you, me. Jeff. Thanks. That concludes our public speaking list and on to our petitions and communications. Council members, any questions or comments on items 6.1 through 6.30? Hearing none, any questions or comments on Office of Communication 7.1 through 7.3? Hearing none, any questions or comments on Report of Directors 8.1? On to our claims and addendums number one, two, and three. So council members are going to be taking a vote on claims and addendums number one, number two, and number three. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bongiano has Aye. left. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Councilperson DeGees. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Claims and addendums number one, two, and three are approved 8-0 with Councilperson Baggiano absent. On to our resolutions. Council members are going to be taking a vote on items 10.1 through 10.12 with the exception of 10.2, which was approved earlier. Councilperson Ridley. On 10.1 uh, resolution for former Councilman Michael Sadalano, uh, I we did uh, make sure that his family uh, knows that this resolution is on here, but I asked them to let us know when they're comfortable with coming. So I'm going to ask if my colleagues would allow them that space probably next meeting for us to read through that resolution, but I didn't want to rush them to uh, attend the meeting. Um, and then on 10.4, I'm going to abstain and vote aye for everything else, and that is in no way a reflection of Mr. Manji. I just haven't been following the story and I'm not familiar with his background, but I believe that um, you know no one should have to go through any extra uh, scrutiny based on uh you know their religion or their outward uh perception or be discriminated against for race religion sex anything um so i hope that he uh does succeed um you know if he is qualified for that position so i'm going to abstain on 10.4 and eye on everything else okay councilperson prince Aerie. aye Councilperson Bajano is absent. Councilperson Soleil. Just want to um, remember the life of Michael uh, Sotolano and thank him and his family for his service and for lending him to mm -hmm. Jersey City for the time that he was with us. Um, I, for 10 4, uh, it, it's very hard being a, a Muslim American um, nowadays. It feels like not just post 9-11, but 1950s, 1960s with the um, McCarthyism and the way that Muslims are demonized um, in open public. It feels like it's open season on Muslims. I am proud to work with Councilman Solomon on this. Um, Adil Manji is a renowned lawyer and he should be confirmed and the fact that they are a handful of people using islamophobic attacks to discredit his literal stellar legal career is absolutely abhorrent i call upon the democrats to grow a spine and for the republicans to grow a heart or get a heart um, and find a moral compass because although a lot of Muslim Americans are the younger generations might be Democrats, a lot of the older ones are also very conservative. Um, so 
I, I thank the senators and Joe Biden for putting this forward, but they need to seal the deal and they need to protect the deal. Um, and he is a resident of Jersey City and we must stand by him and ensure that his name is not sullied in the national media and that we make sure he gets confirmed. With that, I vote aye. And thank you, Councilman Solomon. Thank you, Councilperson Solomon. Yeah, um, vote aye for all. And then just briefly on 10-4, as uh, Councilman Soleil said, and I appreciate him, his partnership on this. You know, Mr. Manji is a Jersey City resident, and he would make history with this nomination. He would be the first ever Muslim American on an appeals federal appeals court. Um, and he has the most impeccable record of, you know, possible. And so what they've done is they, they've done the McCarthy guilt by association. So it's like, you've never done anything that anyone could ever object to. So we're going to find the most distant connection and try to pretend that that is related to you. And, and that does not happen to, you know, uh, you know, white men when they're up there, you know, this is specific uh, because of his uh, religion, um, because he would be a historic skin color, because he would be a historic nominee. And, and the fact that there are Democrats wavering now uh, on his nomination is just, you know, kind of the worst of politics. So, you know, obviously uh, as a Jersey City resident, we, we want, you know, he's a history maker in our city. We we want that there and we want to express our, our view that what's happening uh, is awful, but we should be focusing on the positive of that. This is again, you know, the most impeccably qualified nominee possible. The Bar Association rates him, you know, as high as possible. Uh, he would, he would be history maker in our city. And, and uh, we thank Senators Booker and Menendez for moving this forward, but we need every single Democrat to push this nomination uh, through and, and get him on the bench. So that's why uh, we have the resolution here and voting aye for all. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGees. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Waterman. Okay, city ordinances 10.1 through 10.3 are approved 8-0 with Councilperson Bajano absent. Uh, item 10.4 is approved 701 with Councilperson Ridley abstaining and Councilperson Baggiano absent. And items 10.5 through 10.12 are approved 8-0 with Councilperson Baggiano absent. On to our next set of resolutions, items 10.13 through 10.23. Again, that's 10.13 through 10.23. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prince Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. I have to abstain on 1013. Okay. I'm an employee there and I'm in the uh, memorandum. I'm very excited for this. I do think it'll be great for the shelter. Um, and our students had some excellent ideas, but Director Flanagan and Brooke put together something that was really great for high school students and out of school youth students. And I think it's going to start to revamp the volunteer program at, at the shelter. So I have to abstain on that, but I would vote aye on the rest. Thank you. Councilperson Rivera. Same, I vote aye and I'll abstain on 1013. Thank you. And Council President Waterman. Okay. All right, so item 10.13 is approved 602 with council members DeGees and Rivera abstaining and councilperson Bongiano absent. Items 10.14 through 10.23 are approved 8-0 with councilperson Bongiano absent. Uh, before I call for the, the, um, the balance of our resolutions, I just want to confirm with our BA that we're gonna, we are going to be withdrawing 10.31 since we're going to have a closed session. Yes, that's right, Sean. That's the uh, settlement that we're going to be discussing at the closed session next week, two weeks. Okay. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right, so on items 10.24 through 10.39, with the exception of 10.31, which has been withdrawn, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prince Aye. Councilperson Bajan. Oh, excuse me, Councilperson Soleil. You're saying this is for the balance of. It's the balance, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I want to vote aye for all for um, 1038. It's, um, you know, our solemn duty. And I know my council colleagues worked alongside Councilman Michael Yoon. It's an honor for us to be able to push this forward 
the anniversary, four year anniversary of his passing is coming up April 6th. And um, this bronze statue, I don't know if you saw the attachment, it's going to be a welcome and beautiful presence in the Heights. Public service is very hard. You know, I don't have to tell you guys that. And, you know, his family sacrificed a lot. Michael Yoon sacrificed so much for this city. Um, and this is a beautiful way for us to remember him. He is the he is the shining example of the American dream. And um, may he be an example for everyone else in Jersey City and inspire all of the any anyone else to not just start a business, but get into public service and serve their community. And with that, I vote aye. Thank you, Councilperson Solomon. We miss Michael a lot. I vote aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGees. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. If Michael was here, he would say I scratch my head. <laughs> but uh, I vote aye on all. <laughs> He would also be asking more questions and about the budget and the cost. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. And Council President Waterman. And point thirty two and I own all the rest. OK. Motion. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Wasn't here to vote no on it. <laughs> second. Give me give me one second, guys. Okay. Sorry. So ten point thirty two. Where I get there. So 10.24 through 10.30 are approved 8-0 with Councilperson Baggiano absent. 10.32 is approved 7-0-1 with Council President Waterman abstaining. And items 10.33 through 10.39 are approved 8-0 with Councilperson Baggiano absent. So may I have a motion to adjourn at 1017 Second. p.m. <laughs> motion made by Councilperson Rivera, seconded by Councilperson Soleil. All council members present by acclamation, please say aye. We are out of here at 1017 p.m. Thank you so much, everyone that was present and still present and everyone watching at home. Remember, teamwork makes a dream work. Have a great night. Stay safe. <laughs>